Just a reminder to everyone, this meeting is being recorded and it's being um, conducted virtually using remote technology, uh, given the relief that the governor issued in an executive order for public bodies like ours so that we could conduct our meetings remotely. Um, and we've been doing this since, so since March, um, which is hard to believe. Um, I'll open the meeting, call to order. It is public meeting number 329. And we'll begin with the minutes, Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, do you want to do a call to order first? Oh, I'm oh, sorry, call. thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I have to do that given our virtual um, operations. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner uh, Zuniga. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. And Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. And I'm here. So for the record, all five are present and we can get our business underway. We'll start with the uh, minutes. Thank you so much. Sure, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, in your packet, you have three very quick sets of meeting minutes. These were open public meetings prior to going into an executive session. So pretty short, but uh, we'll go through these one at a time. Uh, first, I would move that the commission approve the minutes of the August 28th, 2020 public meeting, subject as always to any corrections or typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Thank you. Do we have any questions on, on those minutes? Okay, we'll go ahead with a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Sorry, aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, five zero, Shara, thank you so much. The next set? Sure, the next set, uh, the public meeting minutes from the September 3rd, 2020 meeting. Uh, again, I would move their approval, again, subject to any questions for typographical errors or any other non-material matter. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any questions or edits on those? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. And the last set. Uh, sure, the last uh, set of meeting minutes are from the November 9th, 2020 public meeting. I would move their approval subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non material matters. Second. Thank you. Any questions or edits on this last set? Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thanks, great work, Shara. Thank you very much. Then Bruce. Okay, thank you, then. thanks, Shara. Thank you so much. So now moving on to our, our next matter, um, Executive Director Wells, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, to start off, I'd like to give a staffing update. I have very good news. Uh, we have uh, onboarded our new chief of the licensing division, Nikisha Skinner, who is uh, on the meeting today. Good morning, Nikisha. So uh, we are extremely fortunate to have her coming on board. She has an extremely impressive resume and background. Uh, she comes to us with over 20 years of experience in government administration. Uh, she's an attorney. She uh, most recently was the general counsel at the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance, and before that had been the general counsel at the Boston Public Health Commission, and she had been an assistant general counsel there as well. Um, she is a lovely person. We have been so happy to have her come on board. Uh, the team is very excited. It was very excited during the interview process to have someone just of her character and just the type of uh, wonderful human being that she is. So we're lucky to have her. I'd like to welcome her on board. I, I'll give her a chance to say hello to the team because I know there's a lot of people here from the agency that haven't had a chance to meet her. So I'll give you a chance to just to say hello, but I wanted to just give you a warm welcome and we're very happy to have her on board. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Good Chair morning. and commissioners. I just want to say I'm really excited to be on board, looking forward to working with the team and uh, the partnership uh, with the casinos. Thank you so much. It's been such a warm welcome from everyone. 
Um, and I just ask for your patience as I uh, feel my way around over these next couple of weeks. And doing so virtually, an added bonus, uh, Nikisha. Um, I think that I, I, I've been lucky enough to meet um, with you and I know many of my colleagues. So again, welcome. Welcome to uh, your first public meeting. And I just wanted you to know that um, one of your teammates, Marianne Bratton, gave a shout out on the chat for the whole team and say, expressing how lucky uh, the licensing team feels. So. Um, I thought I would make that public, Marianne, just because it's such a special, um, a special sentiment. Good job, Marianne, just like we practice. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I'd, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Derek Lennon for covering the supervision of the unit. As we all know, it's very difficult to, co to cover two jobs, especially when he has such a, a big job to begin with, and then also such an important position as licensed. Uh, chief to cover that. So he did a tremendous job, really brought the team together during the transition period, uh, did some substantive work along the way with the whole team. They're working on policies and procedures. Uh, and they're also, uh, have, with Loretta Lilios, have developed the whole transition plan uh, for giving the information uh, that Nikisha's going to need over to her in a real comprehensive manner. So ter tremendous job. No surprise, you know, anyone that's worked with Derek knows uh, what kind of caliber of it employee he is, but just wanted to say thank you, Derek, for doing that, um, and and congratulations to the team. You had a good interim, and now you've got a, a, a really great opportunity to, to work with Nikisha going forward. Yes, Derek, thank you, Derek. Me. I didn't know if, Derek, um, you popped in if you want to say anything. It's been, it's been an absolute, thank you for the opportunity to work with the team. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and you know it's with mixed emotions sad to turn over the reins but um really happy to have nikisha here because she's going to do an excellent job with that team that's the, that's what i thought you might convey so nikisha that's a great sign when somebody who's as busy as derek is, is suggesting that it was hard for him to to let go of that um that great team so welcome to nikisha and again thank you derek karen Okay, so uh, now oops, sorry, what's my phone? so uh, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Loretta Lilios and Bruce Band to give you another uh, regular update on what's going on on site at the casinos. We've been doing these periodically just uh, because of the COVID situation. Make sure you know what's going on on property and make sure that the uh, uh, procedures that you put in place are being followed at the casinos. So why don't I start with Loretta and then we'll jump over to Bruce. Good morning. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, operations under the COVID requirements and restrictions are continuing to go well, including over the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, tomorrow will be the four-week mark of when the 9.30 nightly closing time went into effect, and that is being carried out in a safe manner, in an orderly manner. Uh, Announcements are being made by each property over there. Uh, public service announcement systems ahead of closing time. Uh, advance notices are being made at table games and disabling of slot machines at preordained times are happening each evening. Uh, and all of that has uh, uh, led to an orderly uh, process. At all three properties, there are no issues with occupancy, even on the busiest nights. Uh, they are below the 50% of the reduced capacity level set by the commission. Uh, at Encore and MGM, the two properties with hotels, the hotels do remain closed. Uh, three of Encore's restaurants, uh, um, uh, offered alcoholic beverages with takeout orders. Uh, for now, they've offered beer and wine. Uh, that's consistent with the emergency COVID-related legislation uh, and with the commission's authorization made on the uh, November 25th. That went has gone smoothly. Uh, as you know, the commission has required that each licensee maintain a communications plan to alert patrons and the public to what they can expect at their respective properties vis-a-vis -vis the COVID measures, and they are uh, doing so. Uh, the posted hours for MGM are 8 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. They recently added two hours in the morning. They were at 10 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. They're now at 8 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. 
on course posted hours are 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Plain Ridge 7 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Uh, we were made aware uh, that MGM's Facebook page and Instagram accounts were for a time mistakenly stating that the closing time was 10 p.m. instead of 9.30 p.m. Uh, that has been corrected. Uh, I do uh, want to note that that was a, a mistake, but that they did always close uh, at the required time. Uh, the actual closing time was not affected, but, but these accounts uh, were for a time uh, mistakenly uh, putting out 10 p.m. So once again, I can report on the high level of compliance and cooperation and hard work by the licensees and their employees. And again, with very limited exceptions, there's general acceptance and cooperation with the public and patrons uh, with these uh, very significant measures uh, that have been put into place. Um, I'd like to invite Bruce at this time uh, to report on uh, anything uh, you know, he's noted, uh, and then of course try to answer any questions that you, you might have. Uh, Loretta was so thorough this time and there was really nothing eventful over the past uh, uh, week or so, so uh, I have nothing additional to add to that report. Uh, things have been going very smoothly. Any questions for Loretta and Bruce? Um, I have one just, uh, it sounds like, you know, these, you already uh, spoke to this, but perhaps more specifically, um, early on, the, the exit of, um, of Encore um, was a bit of a challenge and they were using uh, emergency stairs because of the elevators, as well as there was a bit of a bottleneck exiting the, uh, the parking uh, garage uh, because of its configuration. Um, is there anything that you can tell us that, um, that uh, about that uh, particular topic when it comes down to um, ushering uh, uh, people um, at uh, closing time? Uh, that seems to be going much smoother. Uh, they've gotten the, the wrinkles ironed out with that. Uh, uh, as any kind of mass exodus goes, uh, there's always a, a, you know, a few bottlenecks or anything, but they've gotten a little more expertise in that area, and it seems to flow uh, much smoother now. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, any further yeah. questions? Madam uh, Chair, Madam yeah, Chair, I want to check in. I want to check in on the same matter. I just want to close this loop, Karen. Make sure there are no further questions for Bruce and Loretta. Okay. Okay, um, Karen. I think I'm guessing uh, that you're giving the same messaging. Yeah. Um, Katrina, our um, chief of IT, has in, is indicating that some folks are having audio concerns. I am seeing that all, I think all the commissioners are not having any problems, but I want to make sure our guests are okay. Uh, I did, uh, Madam Chair, I did get an email from uh, the folks at MGM. They were having an issue, so I just resent uh, or I sent the, the direct link. Um, I see that Seth Stratton is, I can see his name in one of the boxes. Seth, can you hear me or can you uh, get on? I don't see a video. And I see that PPC is on. So I just want to make sure. So I've asked him to try to get re get on and see if, if he can uh, let us know. Or oh, I'm also wondering if it's if the problem is for folks who are calling in. Let me just check. I'm getting a, another message from um, okay, it's a long message. Uh, let's see. Maybe it's not related to this. So we'll just skip over that. Um, Okay, uh, you know what, given um, our agenda uh, starts with MGM, given that they're having a, a problem, I'm, I'm hoping that they can hear, um, but I'm wondering if we could switch up on the next item and start with PPC if they're prepared. I see North is nodding his head. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense, Karen? Uh, to if it's if it's our our licensee that's having problems as opposed to our team. Well, I just got there's a chat from Jill saying, "Has the meeting started?" I can't see or hear anything, which is weird because there's many people that can. So we have 78 attendees, 77. Oh, somebody just dropped off. 
Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it looks as if, how, it, may I suggest maybe we take a five minute pause, let me talk to IT, and then I can report back. I just yeah. uh, think that would be helpful just to make sure we do the right thing, because I'm seeing right. some other messages people are putting in the chat that they're having the same issue. So let me. Right, and, and just so that we can put folks on notice, the suggestion was that I restart the meeting, but if there's a majority of people who are on board, I prefer not to have to do a global shutdown because it requires a, a public posting, et cetera. So okay. I am uh, getting north, it. north, this is unusual. So the good news is that this is, I think it's only happened a couple of times where we've had big glitches. So well, it is uh, 2020, so anything is bound to happen. So ready for it. And we've got uh, a few more, we've got about uh, 20, uh, 28 more days, so. Right. Hey, Kathy, I did get a message from Seth Stratton that the whole team is on now, but no one can hear the audio or see the video. So let me let me talk to Katrina, and then I'll come up with a, a proposed solve so we can. Look okay. Let okay. everybody just pause uh, warm up their coffee or take a five minute break. We'll, we'll um, at least the group that can hear me. Um, we're going to try to reconnect at, at uh, let's make it uh, ten. 1025 and uh, see if we can figure this out. But Does that make sense, Commissioners? Yeah, and to, and to confirm, will we remain with this link open, this, uh, correct, mm -hmm. for the time being? Yes, yeah, so I'm not shutting this down yet, remaining this okay. one open. So just if you want to take a quick break from the video, I'm going to close out and warm my coffee. Thanks. And Karen, you were just finishing up the, uh, the COVID-19 report. Mm -hmm. um, and I think then you're going to go, uh, I, I think we had all of our questions asked of Loretta and Bruce. And then I think we were gonna hear from Dr. Lightbound, who I see, so I'm hoping and she can hear. So yes, I can. Uh, Dr. Lightbound, would you like, uh, Karen, is that your plan for your? Yes, I, yeah, I think that that makes sense. We go to Director Lightbound and then um, I'm gonna, Katri I'm gonna, Katrina just suggested sending an email to the entire staff to call in so they will know to do that. And then if, um, Sarah, if you could um, put something on the website, letting the public know to call in for this meeting, yeah. that would be helpful. But the team doesn't, if they're on now, they don't have to get off. Um, no, it's just if they, the can't, if they can't see or hear, then they can participate by phone. Right, excellent. Yeah, we'll update it now. Great. Okay. Okay, excellent. All right. All right, so since Director okay. Lightbound, Dr. Lightbound is here, I will turn that over to her. Just, it, significantly, uh, huge success through the racing season during COVID, keeping people safe, moving that forward, keeping the industry uh, going uh, in these troubling times. So I did really want to give a, a big shout out to Alex uh, for doing that and showing real leadership in that area. I'm glad it's over and we did it. Um, there, our whole team is safe. The, the, the property was safe. They worked in partnership with PPC. So compliments to the PPC and the horsemen that worked all together to make this a successful season. So I thought it'd be great for Alex just to give a little update on the conclusion of the season. Today. Thanks, Thank Alex. you for that introduction. And uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, first, I want to congratulate uh, Steve O'Toole and his racing staff and the horsemen and horsewomen at PPC and our own um, MGC racing staff. Um, our goal when we were um, looking at reopening was to have a safe and sustainable reopening. Um, and we were um, very fortunate through a lot of uh, hard work and a little bit of luck, I'm sure, uh, to get through the meet. So um, wonderful uh, work with everybody pulling through. Um, I wanna thank um, Chris Mackerling again um, and the horsemen um, and Steve O'Toole for their efforts in coming up with the COVID plan. Um, we worked uh, diligently on this um, to come up with a good plan. Um, and then, um, of course, once you have a plan, you have to implement it. Um, and that was uh, almost as hard as coming up with a plan. <laughs> so again, um, thanks to Steve O'Toole and his staff. Um, the, uh, he also got uh, good support from the gaming side of PPC, uh, multiple um, people uh, chipped in and helped on the racing side as well. And again, um, for the horsemen for their cooperation in getting through this. Um, we had a safe meet as far as uh, regular racing uh, issues go. We didn't have any catastrophic injuries with the horses. Uh, there were a couple of accidents with the horsemen, but I'm uh, pleased to report 
they are either recovered or recovering. And it just reminds us that um, it can be very dangerous working with horses. Um, <clears throat> we had very few medication issues this year. Um, and again, that uh, compliments to the horsemen for um, following uh, all the multiple guidelines we have for that. Uh, <clears throat> We ended up uh, giving out about uh, 7 million in purses. So that's a significant amount of money that will help the horsemen winter over um, and get ready for next year. And in addition to that, there was about $1.3 million given out in the sire stakes program in purses. So um, this uh, was significant and um, obviously uh, numerous people, the horsemen, the folks at PPC and our own staff all um, were able to be employed. Um, they had uh, more recently uh, the Wicked High Five that um, the commission approved a few years ago. Uh, it had gotten up to 47,000 and um, they held it um, until the last day. And that's a program with USTA. Um, so they got a matching, um, matching money with that um, and guaranteed it to 75,000. Uh, there was quite a bit of interest in that pot, so it grew to um, just under 147,000, um, and it ended up paying out $245 for a 20 cent wager. So that was some excitement at the end of the meet. Uh, Steve O'Toole and his uh, racing secretary, Paul Verrett, also increased the um, purses for the last several days, so that was kind of like a nice um, Christmas bonus or the horsemen as they uh, head towards the winter. Uh, there is an estimate that there will be a carryover in purse money uh, going forward into next year. And as you probably remember, that worked out being very fortunate um, at the beginning of this season, that there was a carryover from the a couple of years before. Um, so it allowed the uh, track to offer purses that were at a, a very good, decent level. So if, um, Hopefully the casinos can stay open over the winter, but if we, there is a um, temporary shutdown, uh, there is a little bit of a cushion built in there, um, which hopefully will um, make everybody um, feel more comfortable going forward. And um, once again, I just want to thank everybody for their cooperation um, and also the uh, everybody with the MDC staff. Uh, the racing division can't um, function alone, we get a great, great support from all the other divisions and the uh, commissioners. So I want to thank you all as well. Are there any questions? Commissioner Cameron. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, if I'm not mistaken, weren't there a couple of uh, uh, records set this year at the track? Yes, they, uh, s several stakes records were broken and um, they were uh, able to get the um, Spirit of Mass and the Clara Barton races in, their two uh, signature races which um, again, uh, kudos to Plainridge for doing that. They could have easily said that with the COVID and all, they just weren't going to try to uh, do something as complicated as that, but um, they dug right in and that was done um, just a few weeks after they had reopened. Um, and, um, in those two races, there were records broken and also in the um, sire stakes, the mass red races, uh, there were numerous records broken then, which shows uh, just how well that program is doing and how the um, horses are getting better every year. Yeah, great, thank you. Other questions or comments for Dr. Lightbaum? Sure, uh, Madam Chair, I just wanna uh, chime in. I know Alex thanked a lot of people at PPC and the Harness Horsemen and our team at MGC uh, down there that do all the testing work and licensing work, but uh, also just want to extend a, a thanks to Alex for helping out in the great season. Everything from walking around the, the barn area, reminding people to pull up their masks, um, some of the menial stuff that uh, you just kind of think gets done automatically, but it's important and it helped, uh, I think, certainly help uh, PPC and the horsemen get through this uh, unusual year. So a, a special thanks to Alex that she's thanking everybody else, but uh, certainly a team effort. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Alex uh, demonstrated that you know, the leadership that was necessary um, at that particular time, you really were first on the front line in, from our team to serve during COVID-19. Uh, and 
and, and North, you weren't here, but the um, folks, uh, the horse racing community had really to be educated and Alex and, and Steve and Chris really worked hard to uh, not only comply with all the guidelines, but to really educate about compliance and the horse community responded. And so you know, we're really lucky to have that safe report that you gave us today. And you know, we've all been, we've all had um, Alex and the team and everybody during, uh, who's involved in horse racing on our minds. And uh, we're happy that it was a really successful season. So, so thank you. And one thing we, you didn't mention was the success of Derby Day in terms of what was really an innovation to create COVID uh, safety um, um, access for betting for those who weren't going to go and, 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 and be at the, um, the casino or um, at the um, horse racing um, venue, but they wanted to, to place the vet. So we had drive-in betting, which brings all kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, visions in mind, but it was safe and it was smart and it was innovative and it was secure. So. Alex, um, you are all part of that, so thank you. Thank you. I love, I love that solution. That was a great idea of uh, PPC to come up with that solution, and it worked very well. Yes, it really did, and and it took the whole, it took the extra police officers on duty, and and the town supporting it. So um, again, it takes a village, and and it was successful, and and it showed that during this tough time, people were were really smart and innovative. I have a quick question and a, and a comment as well. Um, Alex, thank you for that update, it's great. Um, remind us, when are we slated for the, for the opening uh, next year? Uh, is it still around April 15th? Again, provided that everything uh, goes according to plan, not, not, not with changes. But what is um, the opening season next? Yes, uh, it's very similar. Um, right now, I can't think if it's the April 12th or 13th, it's the, the Monday of that week. And so it'll be a very similar um, time season that we would normally have other than COVID. And then it'll run till right after Thanksgiving. Right. And so it's 110 days. And so, yeah, we're looking forward to that. And um, hopefully we won't be delayed this year. Um, not, knock on wood, but um, with the April opening, um, get through the winter. And um, by that time, maybe vaccines will be out enough and all, and um, we won't be delayed with the opening. And we may even be able to um, release some of the COVID protocols that we've had to do, depending on what the situation is. Well, that was gonna be precisely my point and, and comment. And uh, even if we, um, if we have to open with some uh, protocols, um, we, we know them and we've, uh, um, uh, you know, operated under those uh, uh, circumstances, but there's a good indication uh, um, from what's being developed uh, all around us that uh, we will be in a different situation come next April. Um, one that might be looking like a lot more like normalcy. Uh, and we really look forward to that. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody is knocking on wood and, and crossing their fingers, Enrique. Any other questions or comments other than our, all of our sincere congratulations, Alex, and thank yous? All right, thanks so much. Karen, anything else from your administrative no, Nothing more on the administrative update. Um, I will say for uh, item number four, as I mentioned to you last night, uh, Jill Delaney unexpectedly is unavailable. So I'll, I'll be covering that along with Jill Griffin and Mary Taylor today. Right. Right. So we'll get started on the on item um, item number four. Okay. All right. I'll I'll start with that just that introduction because MGM is going to present on that. My understanding, I am hearing that people are now uh, the, the uh, tech issue might be at least solving, if not solved, in that oh, some excellent. people are able to get on. So, excellent. Even better. Yeah. So that that seemed to have worked out. I know our IT team had many people on the phone with the service provider simultaneously. So I think we put the pressure on to get that resolved. Um, well, so I'm going to turn it over. Patience is a virtue, right? Yeah. So, so that okay. seemed to work. Um, so I'll turn it over to Seth to do his introduction of his team. And then Seth, if you need any help with the uh, 
presentation. I know that that was sent to Mary so she can share it. Um, Mary, are you all set with that? I just want to check that Mary's uh, on and available. So that's I'm Mary Thurlock. I'm, I'm ready and, you know, if they want me to do the PowerPoint, I'm ready to do it. Thank you so much, Mary. Okay, so Seth, let us know what works for you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Miller in a minute. Uh, it's interesting. This is like trying my fire because we decided to uh, turn this process over and, you know, thought it'd be a good opportunity for several of our directors, uh, Dan Miller, our director of finance, um, Arlen Carballo, our director of finance, and Jason Randall, our director of HR, to, to own this process and walk through it with you. So this is their first time as a group so it's a it's an interesting um first first experience presenting to the mgc in this uh in this way but um so that's the team we have here today i'll i'll be available for questions and give an update at the end on some of our development but with that i'll turn it over to dan miller and hopefully dan will be able to run with it from here yes can everybody hear me and hopefully maybe see me now I yep. can see you and hear you. Excellent. Right. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and then Mary, yes, if you are able to share uh, the slides, um, we will begin with just the very first one. And I'd like to do just a small introduction if I could. Um, so, and then uh, I already was going to ask uh, for, for your patience, uh, given this being the first time I had led such a, uh, a meeting for, for MG, uh, MGM. But now I'm going to ask more patience, considering we're doing it under these uh, unusual circumstances before. <laughs> Um, usually our first few slides uh, would be highlights uh, of our uh, celebrations and, and, and fun events outside and of course sadly those, those couldn't happen but the one event I did or one highlight I wanted to bring to the forefront was our reopening. Uh, thanks to the collaboration of, of you, the Commission, with Seth, the other licensees um, and then mainly very hard work of all of my MGM colleagues we were able to reopen to the public safely on July 13th. Since then, um, even despite continued tumultuous uh, situations, they have every day brought what we call the show uh, to our guests and patrons. And so for that, I would just very much like to thank all of my MGM Springfield team members for their steadfast, positive attitudes and their hearty New England stamina. Um, from there, uh, I, I would then begin the actual next page uh, with Arlen, our new Director of Finance, who will go over both our revenue and lottery. Um, Arlen, are you there and, and can you take over? Hello, can everybody hear me? We, we can, and I, I insist that we are not able to see you though. Okay. Yes, um, I'm unable to join uh, through video. Okay. Um, so good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our gaming revenues and taxes for the third quarter of 2020 were as follows. July, which, which was our partial month, we generated 10.7 million in gaming revenue and 2.7 million in taxes. In August, we generated 18.5 million in gaming revenue and 4.6 million in gaming taxes. In September, we generated 17.6 million in gaming revenue and 4.4 million in gaming taxes. For the three months ending September 2020, our total gaming revenue was 46 million and total taxes were 11.7 million. In the next slide, you will see our lottery sales by month. Um, for the third quarter, our total lottery sales were 288,000 a decline um, year over year, about 50% for both August and September. Dan, you would have the next slide. I, I do. Before I continue, any questions from the commission? On commission the on, on that. That. So are there any questions on uh, the, the revenue side, commissioners? I can't see you, so you'll have to chime in. Okay, thank you. Seems, seems like a no. Um, so hopefully you can all now see this compliance slide, um, which I have presented previously regarding the number of underage persons being able to either make it onto the floor, game, or you know consume alcohol. What I think is, is wonderful about this slide is just how many zeros 
there are on it. Um, if you are all able to see uh, the, the picture on the left hand side, um, I recently updated it to show that since reopening in July, we have a, a one in and one out um, new entranceway to the gaming floor. We, where we were always such a very open plan gaming floor, now through a security checkpoint, it is the only way to get on and off the, the gaming floor. And that in of itself, um, with some other measures, seems to have done wonders for us uh, and keep down the number of uh, miners gaining access to the floor. Any questions for Dan on this slide? Um, are we frozen? No. No. I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, just Dan, just I'm a comment, you... Madam Chair. Yes. Just the comment is that those numbers are excellent. They've come way down. Uh, this was an area of concern for us as a commission um, since opening. Frankly, their, their numbers in this area were, were somewhat somewhat higher than they are now. So uh, those measures are working and, uh, you know, sounds like the team has really worked to bring this down. So that's, uh, that's a really good thing. Thank you for that. What I would just add is that with this new system, the, the, the great ability is the number of those uh, attempting to gain access with either false or fake IDs that we're able to just stop in their tracks, turn away or turn over to the GEU. Um, so that's worked a lot better too. Sure, and I think that word will get around for those uh, contemplating coming in with a, with a false ID or underage um, that, that these measures are in place. So good, good work. Thank you, ma'am. Other questions on this slide, commissioners? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, I, I now turn back to Arlen and, and she will go over our local and vendor spends. Hello, I'll start with our slide on diversity spend. Um, our total biddable spend for the third quarter was 4.5 million, and of that 11% went to diversity suppliers. Um, we did see a decline in our women-owned business and our minority-owned business compared to the prior quarters. However, our veteran-owned business uh, remained flat to prior quarters. Any questions? Um, Arlen, this is uh, Commissioner Stebbins. I think everyone's expectation that it's uh, it reduced operations, reduced capacity. You would see some of these numbers uh, kind of down even compared to previous quarters. Um, are you getting any sense as you reach out to vendors that you've done business with in the past? Uh, one, are they, you know, still in operation and preparing to come back or you know are you doing a somewhat less volume of business with them but you know do you get a sense of how some of your vendors are faring out there um yes so unfortunately during the third quarter i wasn't over our procurement um department um but in talking to the team and kind of um reviewing over the last couple of months i haven't heard um or any of our vendors not um, continuing or not doing business. Um, so while yes, we are purchasing less, um, I think they're in the same boat as any business out there right now. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? I, again, I can't see everyone, so I can't tell if you're leaning in. I guess I, I think it's interesting that you had, uh, it looks like you had at least one Good contract with the VBE. Is that the explanation for the um, the growth in that category? Correct. So that's positive. Was it was it one vendor? Or? Um, I would. Um, I will, can I research that and? Um, oh yeah, that's okay. I just I just wonder because I know that that's a, a category that we all work to you know to make sure they find um, opportunities. So. It, it's just of interest to me. I know that one good contract could probably skew this to, to increase it to that, in that percentage. But that's excellent news, something positive to, to look at. All right, um, I'll move on to this next slide if there are not, is there any more questions? 
Um, our total local spend, and I apologize, we'll have to resend this slide. Um, our total spend was 10 million for the quarter. Our percentages um, for the Commonwealth is incorrect. It was not 28.7, it's closer to 8%. Um, our spend with Springfield was 27.63%. Our spend with our communities made up 7.65%. And our spend with Western Massachusetts made up 0.81%. Would commissioners like to have those numbers just one more time so we can catch up? Do you mind? Yes. Thanks. During the third quarter, um, yeah. our spend with in the Commonwealth made up 8%. Within Springfield, it made up 27.63% of the total. Surrounding communities, 7.65%, and Western Massachusetts, 0.81%. So it's just the um, the uh, Commonwealth spend that needed correction. Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. And were there other corrections on the others? On any other numbers? Um, yes, yeah, so the total spend is stated as 12.5 million, but it was 10 million. Okay, any questions? And you'll just substitute that, Mary. Um, Thurlow, I'm sure you'll coordinate that with, with MGM. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Erlen? Okay, thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it over to Jason. Thank you, Jason. Hey, good afternoon, Commission. Not sure if my video is showing or not, but hopefully you can hear me. I'm happy to share our Q3 employment numbers. So we are on the employment number slide at the top level. You can see we ended Q3 with 911 total employees, of which 839 were full-time and 72 part-time. On the lower section of the, pay, of the slide here, uh, you can see the rolling four quarters of our active employee numbers. Um, with the goal breakdown for minority veteran women, Springfield residents, Western Mass residents, and Massachusetts residents um, as well. So, um, of, of highlight, no large shift in uh, percentages towards our goal, with the largest being a decrease in the percentage of uh, women employees um, here. And, and um, unfortunately, I think as we called back employees and we brought back in seniority order, you know, our efforts to bring women into the workplace here, they um, came in with less seniority, um, so hadn't been recalled as of yet. And then if we advance to the next slide here, we have a, a graphic showcasing um, our progress on hiring goals um, as well, to, uh, just to share those percentages on one page. I have a quick question, Jason. I'm hearing you say that it really was an impact of the seniority um, return. Did you also hear that women were also challenged because of um, needing to be at home for childcare? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we've had those difficult conversations with um, employees who, who wanted to return and were eligible to return but couldn't for, for a variety of reasons, um, really mainly the, the home uh, care reason for sure. Yeah, yeah so it's an extra challenge. The number of women who have been displaced has been astronomical. It'll be hard to get them back in. So, any questions uh, so far for Jason? I'm sorry to have interrupted, but. Uh, Jason, this is uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Is, is, again, we kind of go through this period, you know, are you maintaining outreach and communications um, with some of the impacted employees who? Uh, had to be furloughed or let go, obviously, and I hope at some point maybe that they have an opportunity to come back on board. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our management team has been um, really great at maintaining their communications with employees, uh, you know, during the closure and, and, and continuing even after opening with those employees that haven't been able to return. Um, we have 
heard of employees who are securing employment elsewhere and you know, we'll, we'll still knock on their door when it's um, time for us to bring them back and see if they have interest in returning. But um, we do know that um, there is a good number of, of employees who, who are moving on to either in other industries or other companies at this time. Okay, thank you. Commissioners? Thank you. Do you want to continue, Jason? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll actually hand it over to Seth Stratton here to talk about community. Thanks, Jason. Um, so we've, despite the, the challenges that we've experienced, one of the priorities of, of our management, including in particular our president and CEO, Chris Kelly, has been to continue to be engaged in the community and find ways that we can um, support the community, both to achieve our um, philanthropic and uh, corporate social responsibility goals, but also uh, to boost employee morale because uh, our employees um, almost universally enjoy partaking in these types of activities. Been creative in finding ways that we can do that. Um, and we've been proud of what we've been able to accomplish um, uh, you know, since COVID hit. Uh, in the photos you see, in this slide are some of the activities during the third quarter, which was you know some of the hotter months. And one of the one of the things we've done, you'll see um, both the water and then the far right the uh, backpack photos. It's, you know, with the, the revenue challenges we've had, it's it, it's tougher to to um, be philanthropic because you have less money coming in. And so what we've done is we really look creatively at what we had um, in stock at our warehouses. Uh, giveaways, things that we had available that we could use. And water was one of them. During the hotter months, we there were some cooling centers. We have a lot of MLife water that we delivered throughout the city. You see that photo with the mayor. He was very appreciative of support of the, the city cooling centers. Uh, you see on the far right, the children holding up backpacks. Those are actual actually backpacks that we had done as giveaways to our customers, and we had some stock left that we found in our warehouse and we said, well, that'd be great with school starting um, to be able to use these backpacks for some of our local students. And then we, we um, acquired some office supplies that we had on site and ordered some more through our vendors to fill those backpacks so that the, um, a lot of the students who were, even though they were um, homeschooling, they could have their, their school items um, you know, um, all in one place. So that, and then you see in the middle, uh, we participated in um, a, a great partnership that we continue to have with links to libraries where we, we were able to get some um, books in the hands of Springfield school children. Um, the focus of this book giveaway was, was books that really um, uh, were focused on diversity, uh, focused on um, uh, characters with diverse backgrounds so that the folks, um, the, the children who read them could see themselves reflected in in the stories. Um, we thought that was really critical during this time um, with some of the issues that were going on throughout the country. So that was well received as well. So um, we continue to do our best to be engaged in the community uh, during this time and find creative ways to do it um, despite some of the challenges. Any questions there? Questions, commissioners, for, for uh, Seth? You know, that's a great, it's a, it's a great uh, couple of really um, inspiring little stories, Seth. Thank you for that, um, being resourceful and, and keeping to your, um, to your commitments. Um, it's really great to hear. Thank you. Um, if we can move on to the development slide, future impact and the, the development update. Um, so the two, you know, it, there's, there's not a whole lot of activity right now, obviously, given the, the circumstances, but um, during this quarter, um, we made, um, we we're making finishing touches on the Wahlburgers site. That is now complete, uh, complete and ready, uh, as I believe has been, um, I, as I believe the commission's aware and we've, we've discussed. Um, originally, uh, we were planning for a, a fall opening with Wahlburgers, um, given some of the restrictions in the current environment. Um, the Wahlburgers team collaboratively with us as landlord 
determined that that it made sense to um, await the, the spring for an opening. So um, we are continue to be um, uh, collaborating with the Wahlburgers team on making sure this the space, which is which is complete, uh, is ready and available. Um, they're prepared for for an opening. Uh, we want them to uh, have the opportunity to open into a a successful environment and. I uh, think that will be mutually beneficial for them and for, for the property. Um, and then the, the good news is uh, on the 31 Elm project, um, right adjacent um, to our property, uh, the city has, um, has not taken their foot off the pedal on uh, the remediation of that property to prepare it for the, um, the rehab and utilize the time um, during the summer and fall to, um, to complete that. Um, my office actually, um, when I'm in my office, <laughs> um, looks out over this property and, and throughout these months, I was able to see um, cranes and, and workers making solid progress. Um, so we, it's on track. Um, it was, you know, the financial close was delayed by a few months, it was anticipated um, the financial close to occur this fall. Uh, it's now expected at some point in early 2021. Um, if you recall, the city, um, we, the city which currently uh, holds the property was going to do their work, complete their work prior to uh, financial close and transferring the property to the developer uh, for them to do the remainder of the work. Um, so that is still on schedule from what I understand. Um, we are still planning to make our financial contribution and um, we look forward to that um, beautiful property uh, being brought back to its former glory. Uh, in terms of the armory, really that the, the space has unfortunately been dark during this period. Um, the nature of the activation in the armory um, is its larger crowds which have been restricted. So um, we look forward to um, uh, hopefully in the near future, um, an opportunity to engage for the other. And I'll stop there. Any questions? Uh, just a small a question, uh, uh, Seth. Is that second picture um, a picture from the inside of, you know, from left, a uh, picture from the inside of 31 Elm or? or yes, it is. Something else. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the first two pictures uh, started from the left are the interior of the 31 Elm kind of post remediation and cleanup that the city has done. So um, they, they removed a lot of um, material, uh, cleaned it and prepared it for the renovation work. And that's what those two photos represent. Great. It's going to be a, be a, a great view as I'm sure it was in its oh. heyday. I think yeah, Commissioner that is, Cameron's that old... already picked out her unit that she wants. So. <laughs> that might be it right there. <laughs> yeah. It's the old, the old first right. church in the, yes. uh, in the foreground. <laughs> um, Commissioner Seth, Cameron. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, but I, okay. I said exactly the same thing to Seth the moment he sent that photograph to me for the presentation. Was was that was going to be your view? Oh, that's it. That's the view. That's the view. I thought you were going to tell me, Daniel, that you wanted it, so then we'd have a bidding war. Yeah, yeah. Um, if everybody is noting the um, the picture on the left, the hallway, it is that narrow, yes. and I I that can't be salvaged. Uh, it's it's of course historically very interesting, but that doesn't meet ADA standards. So will they be having? They're going to be widening that and therefore narrowing Commissioner Cameron's unit. <laughs> <laughs> That's my understanding, unfortunately. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's historically so, you know, you can imagine folks walking down with their bags. But for, for those of you who did do the tour, which I think is at one point or another, all of you on the commission and, and a number of the staff, um, you can just tell from these two photos, it's much cleaner. You can, <laughs> the, yeah. The, yes. the, the debris and other material that was, was in there, uh, it was, was significant and that's now all gone. Right. That's why it looks so nice. We, we wish you could preserve it, but it won't be able to be preserved that hallway. Exactly. Great work. Um, 
and it's nice that it could continue during this time. Great work for, for folks to have. Thank and you. You're welcome. And unless there are any further questions, I completes our presentation. Um, so thank you. Any, any further questions? And of course, um, the revenue slide covered July, August, and September. So we'll know next quarter, of course, the impact of the most recent restrictions. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I can't see you right now. Uh, are you all set? No, I'm all set. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, right. so the, uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be by the PPC Casino. Uh, we've got North Groundsville and Dana Fortney and Kathy Lucas scheduled to present to you. Uh, and then uh, I'll just ask North, would you like Mary to do the same thing and put up the uh, PowerPoint on the screen? And just a big thank you to MGM. To avoid, uh, yeah. Any other complications, but I do have it available if needed. Okay. Yeah. And I just want to point out a, a, a very big thank you to the um, MGM team for your um, patience today and then the excellent presentation. I just didn't get a chance to properly thank you and, and your team. So thank you. Okay. All right. So I'll turn it over to North to go ahead with uh, Plainers Park Casino's quarterly report. Good morning, North. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Plain Ridge Park is pleased to present our Q3 2020 update to you this morning. I'm going to share some of the highlights of our presentation and then pass it off to Dana and Kathy, who can provide you with more detail. On the financial side, the continuing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic negatively impacted gaming revenue, horse racing revenue, and lottery sales. Total taxes were down for the quarter, approximately 4.1 million, or 23% the prior year. Q3 results were also negatively impacted by a partial month of operation in July of 2020. As we look at the in-state spend, we are pleased to report that fully two-thirds of our qualified spend remain within the Commonwealth. With regards to our supplier diversity goals, we are happy to report that we met or exceeded our goals for diverse spend in all three categories with a large increase in the women business, uh, a WBE -E spend in Q3. When we look at the workforce diversity, we're pleased to report that we met or exceeded each of our goals for minority, women, and veterans participation. Post community and local representation was slightly below our goal, and Kathy will provide you some more context around the reason for the shortfall. On the compliance side, we had zero incidences of underage casino access, gambling, or alcohol service. So that's the high level overview, overview of our update. With that, I'm gonna pass off to Dana and Kathy, who will provide you with a little bit more detail. Dana? Thank you, North. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll begin with slide two, uh, gaming revenue and taxes. We have a lot of information here uh, on this slide for comparison purposes. So I'll draw your eyes to the bottom third of the chart. For Q3 2020, Plainridge generated $27.9 million in slot revenue and taxes paid to the Commonwealth came in at $13.6 million. The year-over-year -year decline of revenue of $8.3 million from the third quarter is attributable to the pandemic. Moving on to lottery sales. Looking at the middle of the table, lottery sales came in at $260,000 for the third quarter of 2020. Lottery sales were down year over year by 597,000 or 70%. <coughs> Volumes increased after reopening the property in July. We reopened our retail shop in late August. This is a basic location for sales of uh, tickets like Mega Millions and Powerball. Uh, so since that time, we've steadily seen our lottery sales increase. The next slide is our spend by state for the third quarter. In-state spend was 368,000 or 67%, up from 110,000 uh, from Q2, in-state spend of 258,000. The remaining spend for the quarter is split amongst the states on the right. Our overall qualified spend was 551,000 in Q3, consistent with the second quarter's 568,000. Should we pause here, um, yes. Dana, just to see if there are questions on either the spend or the uh, revenues? 
while we Absolutely. have the slides. Questions, commissioners? Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to local spend. Um, Local spend for the third quarter, our in-state versus local spend shows a modest increase from the second quarter of 5%. The second quarter was just around 19,500. Our driver in Mansfield, as a reminder, is a vendor that provides us our disposable paper products. Next is our diversity goals. As North mentioned, PPC Matter exceeded all of its diverse goals for the third quarter. We ended Q3 at 37% of qualified spend going to diverse vendors. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail on that on the next slide. Finally, diverse spend. This shows the breakout detail of the previous slide. In Q3, 207,000 was spent amongst diverse vendors, representing 37% of qualified spend. The uptick in Weeby spend is due in part to two women-owned in-state vendors. The first was relating to a capital purchase, and the other relates to a vendor that provides cleaning products. Dana, do you want to mention who those WBEs are, if you can? I, I can. Um, the first is Kitridge for equipment, and then uh, secondarily is Millhench Industrial Supply. Okay. I think I think we had heard previously that that was a WBE that had kind of pivoted their their business uh, to provide a service during this COVID related period, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But um, it's, it's great to hear and great that you picked up some work for them. Definitely, Milhench has been a, a longstanding vendor with us. So if there aren't any questions relating to diverse spend, then I will pass it on to Kathy to go over compliance and employment. Can we just go back to that slide on just the minority spend? So there was a decline of 50, about 53%. I guess maybe my question is similar to what Commissioner Stebbins asked of MGM. Is there an explanation? Not a, um, it's not a, a, an enterprise that went under during this time or anything like that, just uh, the change in operational needs? Yes. we have. We don't have any knowledge right now of any of our vendors that have um, closed business due to the pandemic. So it's just a change in um, what the property is in need of right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Good morning, Madam Commissioner and Commissioners. Um, I'll share uh, the updates in regards to compliance and employment. So after opening in July with a single entry point and ID restrictions, we prevented 864 from entering the casino. Of that, seven were minors and 17 were underaged. During the quarter, no minors or underage made it on the gaming floor, gambled at slot machines, or consumed alcoholic beverages. We turned away 840 people with, appropriate, with inappropriate IDs as a result of reviewing all identification of patrons which um, when we look back at Q1 was a significant increase. We uh, turned away only 224. So the single entry point and also ID for all of the uh, patrons was uh, led to that increase. Go to the next slide. So turning to employment, this exhibit shows that we exceeded our goals at the property level for minority women and veterans with a slightly lower than the goal in the local team member employment. During the quarter, most of our team members were inactive due to furloughs and processes to ensure career opportunities for women's veterans, diversity and local candidates were on hold due to the COVID restrictions. Um, because of that, we were unable to attend the mass hire job fairs in Easton or Fall River the recruit military job fairs, the Boston Veterans Job Fair at Gillette, because they were all canceled. Although we were not recruiting for positions because of the furlough and the COVID res restrictions, we did do career branding with some of our diversity partners like the Boston Pearl Foundation and Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority. We exceeded our women's goal target of 50% and we remain focused on attracting women by partnering with organizations still like the Women's, Inc., Women's Link 
and also with uh, the sororities and other organizations that are local to us. In Q3, we also had team members um, from a veteran standpoint, uh, we were able to continue to uh, work with them via electronic or um, uh, we call it cyber job fairs. We had 420 team members for Q3, 67% of them being full-time and 31% being part-time. And when we did open in July, we opened with 207 of those 420 team members. Any questions? Um, Kathy, this is Commissioner Stebbins. Um, and, and obviously, uh, due to the, the breadth of operations at your facility, I was curious. I went back and looked at your third quarter 2019, and you had an employee count of 454. So to, you know, not to put too positive a spin on it, but to, to be down 34 people from your count a year ago, uh, despite reduced operations and hours, uh, I, th I think is... Uh, is a welcome sign. So thank you for all your good work and your continued outreach. Yeah, thank you. And, and Commissioner Stebbins, um, we are still um, hopeful that we are going to be able to return uh, to members that are available to come back to us once we open a couple of the areas of our business that are still closed, like our restaurants and also our um, banquets and uh, entertainment areas. Where, where we're still restricted. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, this is Commissioner Cameron. If I may just comment on your compliance. Um, since the beginning, I've always been impressed with the job you have done in this area. But these numbers are just, you know, you have all zeros. And in this case, that's a very good thing. Um, but really excellent that you've kept up uh, your diligence as a company and you've taken this matter so seriously. And you're to be commended for those numbers they're tremendous thank you thank you and our, our security team along with the partnership with um the local police and also gu we we just really do a great job and i think the community is aware because we've been doing it for um you know the five years or better that it, it's going to be hard to get onto the property without the right identification Great. Right. Thank you. Go to the last slide. So guided by our values, of course, we are committed to being a great employer and developing better leaders. Over the years, we've created training programs, recruitment processes to ensure career opportunities for women, veterans, diversity candidates, and team members at all levels. This exhibit shows that we exceeded the overall team member goals because we don't have segmented goals for supervisors and above at the property level for minority women and veterans. Uh, we have programs such as Women Leading in Penn, partnerships and recruitment with community organizations focused on women's leadership to help us close the gap with women's leadership roles at the property. Um, we hope to, um, you know, in January restart Women Leading in Penn and also our uh, LEAP program to continue the success we've had with these programs in the past, uh, developing leaders for the next generation of our business. And uh, I'll entertain any questions, and if there are no questions, I'll turn it back to New York. Questions, commissioners? Excellent, Kathy. Thank you. OK, thank you. Madam Chair and Commissioners, this concludes our presentation and we're now available for any questions that you may have on any of the slides we presented. Questions or comments, Commissioner? Commissioner Zinnica? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, no, um, no questions, but perhaps a comment to summarize both presentations um, or my impression of both presentations. This applies also to the one we heard from Ancor. Um, last meeting, uh, but uh, Mr. Miller, I think characterized it well from the team, uh, from the MGM team, that uh, there's this hardy New England spirit uh, coming, coming through 
in, in, um, in what we are seeing. Uh, even if there's decreased revenues, there's very much the idea of continuing to do the work that, that, that uh, the team has been committed to, and, uh, and that is worth uh, noting. I've said before, or I've thought before that uh, this year, 2020, has felt like a snow year, not a snow day. But, uh, <laughs> but the snow days here characterize that hardy spirit. Um, people get to work uh, in the face of adversity, and even those of us that are um, uh, new and not so new to New England, uh, it's really great to see that, uh, that that spirit is prevailing here and it's worth noting. Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set? No, I am. The only thing I would add is also the, um, I appreciate the breakdown of the underage minor. Uh, I know I had asked for that. I'm just glad to see it and glad to see it brings the clarity that I thought it was going to bring. So thank you for that. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner Cameron. All set. Great report. Thank you. Yeah, all said. Great reports by both of our licensees. I, I think we all expected some revenue fall off, but between a combination of uh, hardy New Englanders, as Commissioner Zuniga pointed out, even at reduced operating capacity, uh, I'm, I'm still pretty impressed with the numbers. So, North, thank you. Your first, thank you. your first uh, quarterly report. We're looking forward to um, this occurring in, in person, but today it went very well virtually despite our early start. So thank you so much. Appreciate it, very thorough. Absolutely, thank you so much for the opportunity. Great. Okay, Karen, um, on item number four, we um, now have the Community Mitigation Reserve Grant and Workforce Modification Request. Correct. So we have two requests. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Thurlow to do the first item, uh, which is the Melrose Reserve Grant request. Thanks so much for covering, Mary. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Today we're reviewing two community mitigation funds for your consideration. The first is for the use of reserve funding by the City of Melrose. The second is a reconsideration of a portion of the 2020 workforce development application for Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board and the City of Boston. This application is based on the deferred action agreed to at the June 25th meeting. The Commission agreed that funding could be used if Mass Hire identified a critical need for technical training. This is going to be presented by Jill and Crystal. First, let me provide you with a little bit of background um, and overview of this reserve request. As you may recall, communities may apply for the use of reserves on a rolling basis once needs are identified. A reserve may be used for planning either to determine how to achieve further benefits from a facility or to avoid or minimize any adverse effects. The city of Melrose uh, currently has a neighboring community agreement with the Encore Boston Harbor. However, the city does not receive any annual funding through this agreement. The application before you today is a continuation of Melrose's 2016 reserve. The community expended its initial disbursement for a study which identified the most critical infrastructure improvements needed in anticipation of increased pedestrian and vehicle use to the area as a result of the casino. Melrose is now requesting funds to be used to implement those recommendations that resulted from the study. Through these funds, Melrose anticipates better access to Oak Grove, better public safety for pedestrian crossings, and encourages the use of alternate modes of transportation. Um, and so that's the presentation. Uh, we do need a motion on this, and I'm open to any questions. Questions for Mary today. Very thorough, Mary, as expected. Up, oh, Enrique? Yeah, thank you. Well, I was just going to make a, a comment that um, thank you for all the documentation. It's a, such it's a reminder that um, all the due diligence that the cities and towns go through 
um, even for uh, seemingly small numbers, but very important uh, projects for the for the city. It's um, it's worth noting as included in the packet. Other yeah, comments? Uh, yeah, yeah comment. Madam Chair, I'd, I'd chime in and also come in the uh, city of Melrose. Uh, this is an appropriate kind of next step to what their early uh, reserve grant uh, was looking at. It's going to be some actual hard asset uh, improvements uh, as a result of their study. We've been encouraging some other communities, as we all know, in this round of community mitigation fund grants to use up their reserves. So uh, appreciate and commend the city of Melrose for uh, undertaking the initial set of work and now following up and using the balance of the reserve to get some of these needed improvements done. And I certainly agree with the team's uh, recommendation that this is an appropriate use of these funds and this is this is an excellent project um, and uh, one that will really add value. I, I feel the same way and just wonder, Mary, um, if this might be, again, an example that could be used in your workshops for... Exactly. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're ahead of me. Um, excellent. Uh, if there aren't, aren't any further questions for Mary, we do need um, to have a vote on this yes. in order for Mary to proceed. Yeah. Uh, oh, Commissioner Stebbins? No, Commissioner O'Brien, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I move that the Commission approve the City of Melrose's request to use the balance of its reserve for the purposes outlined in the application and execute a grant agreement with the City of Melrose as included in the Commissioner's packet and discussed here today. Second. Thank you. Any further questions or edits, recommended edits on the, on the motion? Okay. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Great. Uh, now we can turn it over to uh, Crystal Howard and Jill Griffin for the uh, mass hire. Thank you, Mary. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good As um, Mary alluded to, on June 25th, the Commission approved a Community Mitigation Fund Workforce Grant to Mass Hire Metro North for $172,000 to fund adult basic education. Um, as you remember, um, the labor market had collapsed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the Commission deferred funding of occupational training programs such as hospitality and culinary skills training. Um, Mass Hire Metro North's original application included a proposal for best hospitality, um, a subgrantee to run both hospitality focused training and um, English for speakers of other languages classes, um, ESOL uh, classes. Each program's budget was not itemized in the revised proposal submitted in the supplemental application. As a result, um, MGC staff did not recommend at the time funding um, uh, the best line item. Um, we are here today to request that the commission consider an amendment to Mass Hire Metro North's original um, 2020 Community Mitigation Workforce Grant um, to fund subgrantee best hospitality for English classes. I'm going to just turn it over to Crystal to talk uh, a little bit more in detail about the proposal. Crystal okay. Howard. Good morning. Uh, am I having any sound issues? Because I was earlier. No, you're all set, that, Crystal. Okay. All set. Fabulous, fabulous. I think uh, Jill answered uh, uh, or addressed most of what we are bringing to you today. I would just add that um, as she alluded to, there was um, a specific programming subset for English language training included in Mass Hire's um, intent for the original best 
dollars, although that was not provided in the budget for us to actually make an award determination on. <laughs> so they have come back officially to clarify the original intent of that programming, which we've reviewed and found to be entirely in line with our original parameters, and they're requesting 60,000 of that for the English training, uh, which will be provided by BESS, but it is um, uh, language classes. So um, I just think it's worth noting that the funding is also available, given that the original proposal came in for 450,000, which was amended to 400,000. And if this were to be approved by the commission, it will be a total award of 350,000. Could you just say the last number, please, again, Kristen? Sure. Uh, the original award was uh, 270, I believe, and this is 60, so please 330,000. Yeah. Are there okay. any other questions? Questions for Crystal and Jill. Uh, Madam Chair, just a comment. I had a chance to, to chat with director griffin and, and crystal yesterday about this um you know we agreed back in june not to take any action on kind of the balance of the request that was around more technical training uh, obviously uh, this kind of fits into a lot of the skill-based um i'm sorry kind of basic training skill development uh, that we had awarded uh in both regions so um, certainly agree with their recommendation it's all training that can be done virtually and i think even anecdotally there's actually been a request for this program from some folks that were continuing their training or have found themselves uh laid off from the hospitality industry so uh it's encouraging to see folks still want to keep their training going uh, uh, despite the tough employment climate Other questions or comments? Um, uh, just, Commissioner? Go ahead, please. Uh, get no, I was just in, uh, oh, sure. I was just in agreement that this is um, certainly um, something we should award, and I'm glad that they were able to clarify and the team was able to take a second look because probably needed now more than ever. So good work. Uh, and I was going to say just that and agree that uh, with the recommendation, um, not only is this an important long lead, long lead item, um, like, like we talked about in the community mitigation fund, um, but also addresses in a, in a small but important way uh, some of the communities that have been most impacted during this period. So um, doing a little bit um, to further that mission. Um, Madam Chair, I'd move that the Commission approve the Mass Hire Metro North's request to receive funding toward BEST's English language training program in the amount of $60,000 as included in the Commissioner's packet and is discussed here today. Second. Thank you. Any further questions or edits to the motion? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner um, Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes, so that's 5-0. Thank you, excellent work. And um, as uh, Commissioner Zuniga uh, mentioned, it, um, the thoroughness is so appreciated and exemplifies the complexities of that program, so thank you. Um, I have received a request um, for just a little bit of a break uh, before we continue with um, uh, the next item, and I see Carrie popping in and out. So we'll return to legal's um, uh, presentation. Uh, will 10 minutes do? 12:10 uh, return. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. We'll resume in, at 12:10, um, and I'm just going to do a quick roll call again. Commissioner uh, Cameron, I'm here. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I am here, although full disclosure, uh, at 12.30, I'm going to need to disappear for about 15 minutes. We all can't even begin to be in your shoes, but appreciate all the flexibility <laughs> that you <laughs> that you need right now. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, and then Commissioner Zunica. I'm here. Here as well. 
Okay, so all five of us are present. Let's get started then so that we can keep Commissioner O'Brien um, involved in the next session, which is the does require two votes. So um, <clears throat> we'll get started with uh, uh, General Counsel Grossman and Interim Director of IEB, Loretta Lilios. And Carrie, are you actually in taking the lead on this? I am, yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie right. Teresi. Thank so, you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, we have two regulations for you today, so let me um, pull one up and share that. All right, I think we've got it right. And I know Bruce Band is also there to support you on this, so uh, thank you. Uh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Can you see the reg? Yes. With you subsection okay. four. Subsection four. Um, From the date. Operations are getting a little um, error message here. Oh. Oh, here we go. Resume share. Okay, there we go. You could see it, but I couldn't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. All right, so um, there are two regs on the agenda today um, 205 CMR 134.01 related to key gaming employee licensees and 205 CMR 134.02 related to gaming employee licensees. Uh, the changes to these are virtually identical, so I'm gonna run through the changes for both together. Um, these changes are being proposed as a result of the current pandemic to ensure that the licensees can stay fully staffed in key positions like surveillance in the event employees become sick uh, and or need to quarantine. Uh, as you may recall, the commission recently amended the regulation related to gaming service employees to allow the licensees to temporarily permit employees from sister properties to work at the licensee's property without requiring licensure. Um, so these draft regulations track those changes and create that same allowance. Specifically for a period of 60 days after any period of suspension or during an emergency situation, a gaming licensee may temporarily allow, with approval from the IEB, employees from sister properties to work at the licensee's property without requiring licensure. Uh, that term emergency situation is defined in the recently promulgated regulation outlining the commission's authority to act in an emergency and includes things like a state of emergency declared by the governor, a public health emergency, or a natural disaster. And that regulation is cited here in these two regulations. Uh, I do want to note that um, these two regulations govern licensing of key gaming employees and gaming employees, which are, um, you know, which those positions require a high level of expertise in the area. So these are really positions that couldn't be filled easily or as quickly as may be needed by hiring additional Massachusetts residents. And that's why we'd be looking, uh, allowing the licensees to look to sister properties. Um, so in order to uh, bring employees from sister properties, there'd be a few requirements. The licensees would be required to provide certain information to the Bureau, such as where the employee is coming from, the reason they're needed, the services they'll be performing, uh, and how long they would be here. They'd also be required to have any of those employees wear a badge that would distinguish them from any of their licensed employees, the Massachusetts licensed employees. They would need to supply an attestation that those individuals are in good standing in the jurisdiction in which they're employed. And they would require that those temporary employees be accompanied by a licensed employee anytime they're in a restricted area. Uh, so the initial time period would be that 60 day time period, um, but there's a provision here at the end uh, that would allow the commission to extend these positions for up to six months following a period of suspension or for the duration of the emergency situation upon a demonstration of need from the licensee and a recommendation from the IEB and the licensing division. Um, so uh, we're hoping to promulgate these by emergency to get them into effect right away. I know that Director Lilios and Director Band are here as well if there are any questions. Any questions for uh Carrie, I know that most of us have had the benefit of a, a, a briefing, <clears throat> and, we, and we are familiar with this on our, the earlier reg. Okay, so um, it's in no way indicative of the fact that we, um, we're asking no questions, but we, it's because you've been so thorough in our briefing, Carrie. Um, 
You do need a, a motion. I think we should take them separately. Yep, and there's also uh, the motions on the small business impact statements, which are in your packet. And this and and these are prompt. you you are. They are emergency related and needing to go through the emergency process. Correct. That's right. Uh, Madam Chair, I can make the first motion for 134.01. Um, I move that the Commission approve the small business impact statement for 205 CMR 134.01 key gaming employees as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you. Any questions on the, um, on the impact? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes. Five zero, thank you. And the related rank? Yep. Uh, I further move that the commission adopt the amendments to 205 CMR 134.01 gaming, key gaming employees on the emergency basis as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions on that? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinnica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Excellent. And then with respect to the, uh, the second Ragon Gaming Employee Licenses, the Small Business Impact Statement. I'm happy to move on that one as well. Wait, um, wait oh, I'm sorry. Was the last yeah. one the key? The last one was key gaming. Last one was key. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is. Okay, and then this one's again. Okay. Okay. I wanted to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Okay, thank you. So I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for 205 CMR 134.02 gaming employee licenses as included in the commissioner's packet. Okay, any questions on the small business, business impact statement? All right. I'll second. Thank you. I'm sorry, I thought I heard a second. Thank you. No questions, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Thank you. I further move that the commission adopt the amendments to 205 CMR 134.02 gaming employee licenses on an emergency basis as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. All right. Any further questions on this matter? Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Excellent. Um, so that concludes this portion of the legal um, presentation. Commissioner O'Brien, is this where you need to part company or do you have a few more minutes? No, I have about 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll be okay. gone for about. Okay, then excellent. We'll go ahead then with item number six. Uh, General Counsel Grossman, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners and everybody. Uh, we thought, uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to review the Commission's legislative initiatives. Uh, Jill Griffin and Crystal Howard are alongside for this one. Uh, ordinarily, they'd be seated up front here, and here they come. Um, they will be integral to the future of the Commission's legislative program, so they join me uh, here today. The chart uh, in your meeting packet outlines the three existing legislative initiatives that the uh, Commission has before it. Notably, the chart does not include any initiatives that have been concluded. For example, the effort to amend the legal requirements uh, governing the registration of certain individuals working in the gaming establishment, that one has been concluded, so it's not on the chart. 
Um, nor does the chart include any legislative matters that are not the commission's direct initiatives, things like sports wagering, uh, for example. So that's also not on the chart. Uh, so I thought we could just start to work our way through the chart and then, you know, uh, chart a path uh, forward with our legislative uh, program. So if I may, I'd just start with the, the first item, which uh, pertains to essentially charitable gaming. Um, and the oversight of bazaars. So you'll, of course, recall that bazaars are Las Vegas or Monte Carlo night uh, type events, uh, and that they are described in Chapter 23K in Section 4, Paragraph 41, where the Commission is afforded the power to regulate and enforce Section 7A of Chapter 271 relating to bazaars. Um, these activities have historically been overseen in different contexts by the Attorney General's Office and the State Lottery, and the activities continue to be overseen by those entities. So Section 103 of the Gaming Act itself directed the Commission to analyze the laws relative to charitable gaming and report findings and recommendations uh, to the legislature. And so in furtherance of that mandate, in 2012, we began discussions with uh, colleagues at the Attorney General's Office and the State Lottery uh, Commission, including uh, an attorney by the name of Kathy Jetstein at the time, um, who helped us work through some of the issues. And we were able uh, to develop a proposal um, to update Chapter 271, uh, Section 7A. Um, and we forwarded uh, that proposal over to the legislature, it included things uh, in addition to bazaars, but also a number of other provisions uh, that the group thought could benefit from some refreshing, including like the definitions of what a raffle is and what a bazaar uh, itself actually is. And by letter dated January 13, 2013 from Chair Crosby to legislative leadership, the commission submitted uh, these proposed amendments uh, to the laws to charitable gaming. That became uh, House Bill 301, uh, which was sponsored by Representative Wagner um, in the 15-16 legislative session. Uh, there was a hearing before the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies at which uh, Commissioner Zuniga actually testified. Uh, the bill was actually re reported uh, favorably to House Ways and Means uh, where no further action had been reported. And then again, it was refiled in the 1718 session uh, where it was again referred to House Ways and Means and no further action was taken. That was the last activity um, on that particular initiative. Um, so we can, uh, I can keep going uh, through the chart or we can pause there if there's interest in discussing uh, that initiative. Question talk was it is it I take it it's not a live bill at this point then? I no, at this bill, I, at this point the bill is not live. There's nothing okay. pertaining to charitable gaming that I'm aware of that is pending. My instinct is that it's worth us revisiting this because right. it, do you feel the same way, Commissioner? Um I do. Your recommendation. Oh, I think two things. One, the fact that there was um, sort of we're given the power to do this, that we came and gave that recommendation in terms of the draft legislation. To me, it's worth revisiting it to see if it needs to be resubmitted. It, it wasn't in the 1920 legislative session, so I think it's probably right for this compilation of the five of us to look at it again. And the, uh, if I recall correctly, Todd, it, it the responsibilities and authorities, it's quite convoluted in terms of the statutes. And I think the lottery might even be doing some things, you know, almost um, out of service than, um, than responsibility. So I do think um, revisiting this, and probably with our, our Commissioner Zuniga, do you agree with our, the Attorney General's Office and the lottery and, 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 and seeing if we are still aligned. Absolutely, and I, I think you're going to characterize it well that the prior charitable gaming laws are 
sort of broken, maybe broken is not the right word. They're, they're um, dispersed. They reside under different uh, um, jurisdictions. And, and, and this effort was to try to consolidate it, actually under the lottery. Um, there's, there's certain things that the Attorney General is, is um, responsible for enforcement comes to the cities and towns. The lottery has a portion, not on bazaars. So uh, there was, the, and, and by the way, there are a couple of important uh, stakeholders out there in the state, notably um, the Red Sox organization, for example, who have provided important feedback as to, you know, um, these, these type of activity because they do run um, a, a large um, charitable gaming um, operation during their, during their, um, a raffle, the 50-50 raffle during their games. Um, so, but I think it's worth it's it's worth mentioning whether that some of those assumptions still hold true, whether there's still a desire um, to recommend to put it in the, under the lottery, for example. Um, so, I, I I think it's worthwhile mentioning. I I am um, skeptical that the legislature might not view this as as a big as a top priority, but. It's nonetheless in statute and, and I think worth revisiting. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, we thank Representative Wagner because he was co chair of this committee when he filed the legislation. He's obviously moved on to a different position of leadership. We have new leadership of the committee and it might be worthwhile to sit down and revisit these amendments with them as a, as a new legislative session is about to start. Commissioner Cameron? I agree as well. Makes perfect sense. So we'll put that uh, down as a, an early review and um, probably need to reach out to the other stakeholders and see what they think. Thank you, Todd. On that, do you want to move forward then on racing and simulcasting? Yes, very good. Uh, the, so the second item on the chart pertains to horse racing and simulcasting. As you well know, these activities are primar primarily governed by Chapter 128A and 128C, but there are provisions contained in both Chapter 23K and elsewhere to be mindful of, uh, of as well when it comes to the oversight of these activities. So Section 104 of the Gaming Act itself, you may recall, directed the Commission to analyze the efficacy of the laws relative to paramutual and simulcast wagering and report those findings uh, and recommendations to the legislature. The Commission did uh, just that on April 10, 2013 and submitted a report to the legislature, including a proposal for a new body of law to be uh, entitled uh, Chapter 128D. Um, as described in the chart, uh, the Commission submitted refreshed proposals to update the racing laws in both 2016 and 2018. Uh, these efforts were taken up in the legislative process as agency filed bills. Uh, those efforts, however, did not result in the passage of the proposed legislation, as you know. Uh, the most recent activity involved House Bill 13 that was before the uh, Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure where it was ultimately reported as ought not to pass on July 7, 2020. So there was recent activity um, on the latest iteration of the bill. The commission has uh, recently and over the years expressed its support for this legislation uh, specifically and generally on a number of different occasions. That's a, a, a broad overview of the racing and simulcasting proposal. I, I'll pause there. Uh, for comment? You know, um, again, perhaps bringing a little um, of my memory of, um, uh, of the arc of this, um, of this bill, or, or of this, you know, this, this, this topic. Um, I, I happen to believe that it's um, uh, something that a lot of stakeholders uh, and remember, a lot of stakeholders uh, want it to be addressed. It's something that the legislature has chose to continue what has been doing for a number of years, just addressing this uh, one year at a time. But um, given the state of the of the industry, we've heard quite a bit from stakeholders that um, the need for um, 
um, knowing what uh, the, uh, the industry is, is in for would be very important uh, for the industry. So um, I, I think uh, uh, it's it's one of the um, one of the things that, in my opinion, um, continue to bring uncertainty to the horse racing industry um, with its legacy of very many moving pieces. And what this bill or what this submission attempted to do was to streamline a number of those those topics: the takeouts, the premiums, the, uh, and, and, and any number of percentages and and uh, including the use of the Racehorse Development Fund. Um, it might be worthwhile revisiting, just like last, last uh, the, the, the last topic, um, you know, if nothing else to refresh our collective memories, but um, there was a lot of thought that went in it. And, um, and again, unfortunately, um, for whatever reasons, uh, and they have many among being very busy and doing other things, the legislature has not I, I think we spoke about the fact that um, our two newer commissioners, the chair and Commissioner O'Brien, have not really had an opportunity to understand this in detail and, and probably that's needed at this point before a decision is made about moving forward. My apologies for um, moving in the middle, but I, I could tell that I was having a connectivity issue. Um, I appreciate that, Commissioner Cameron. And Commissioner O'Brien, maybe you want to chime in? I would agree. I mean, I agree with both um, what Enrique and Gail said. Namely, um, I do think I'd like to be able to do a deeper dive, but I also think um, that this topic, because of its import to our regulatory responsibilities and the racing industry is also something that merits us staying on top of it. And so I think that for both reasons, we should do the deep dive so we can then, as a commission, vote on what we want to do moving forward in the immediate, in the not so distant future. I guess one of the things that I'm not updated on, um, Todd, is HB 13 is was distinctly different from the earlier filing, but to accomplish the same goal because it looks like if i'm that the legislature actually acted on that one or are they two separate that's well it, it it's a great question the um so the last two versions of it house bill 9 and house bill 13 so that's from the 18 uh, from the past two sessions were fairly similar there has okay. been a different version that um, Senator Boncor proposed, which is, you know, based on the model we proposed, but slightly different. It is worthy of note, though, that the initial version that was proposed back in was it 2014, the initial version that uh, was sent over though it was entitled 128D, is slightly different from the one that became the Commission's proposal in 2016. Um, so they're all slightly different, and I think as in, described, yep. And HB 13 is that filing, that latest that is, filing? That's the most recent. Okay, all right. So interestingly, it looks as though there was actually, you, you noted this action on that. Yes. Okay. I'm sure it was. Um, and the commission has been active um, on, uh, on that front as well. So, well, I uh, agree that we should re, re examine it. And I appreciate Commissioner Cameron's point that, you know, we think Commissioner O'Brien and I would really benefit sort of a more extensive detailed understanding of of um, the original filings and and the original thinking of the commission and then the other um filings here that you reference is of course the ongoing um communications that we have with the legislature when we've come against the ex uh, the, the deadline um for the extension of the racing commissioner cameron is that correct? That is correct. 
Yeah. And so the next deadline, it's actually, is it July rather than January, if I if I remember correctly? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, so that's, I mean, the deadline part is a manifestation of, you know, kind of the ongoing right. efforts to adjust the racing laws in general. Um, we just, so We're just helpful in the, that reminder because it, it's one of those things that can, you know, become overlooked accidentally. So we'll be right. mindful of it. But we, it's not January this year, it's July. No. All right. Any questions um, on that, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner Zuniga? Uh, no, I just echo Commissioner Zuniga's comments. You know, we'd love to offer some level of uh, confidence and consistency to the racing industry um, and find a find a solution that can be a little more long lasting. But certainly appreciate Madam Chair and Commissioner O'Brien um, needing some time to take a deeper dive, but. It, I think it'd be great if somewhere after the first of the year as the new legislature convenes that uh, we could begin that outreach again and, and have a agency filed bill. Uh, hopefully to hopefully this would be the year. And and a reminder on the um, and that you may have said this earlier, I think I was in transit of the filing uh, uh, deadline for the agency. I I, I didn't I didn't okay, say you, I didn't. Have, you know I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain. Okay, we'll but just we be. Need to, yeah, we'll have to look at that. Okay, excellent. But you know, on on, on that note, um, perhaps something that we uh, can now do um, with a little bit more lead time. Um, my my take is that, um, and because this was the case for me, that there's not a great understanding at the legislature of all the moving pieces of. Um, of the racing industry, specifically with the Racehorse Development Fund, and 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 how that is supposed to work with um, with a number of other things that have been left unresolved, and so we've seen um, efforts that have been unsuccessful, for example, but very important to note about trying to take uh, money that comes to the Racehorse Development Fund and and, and put it into <laughs> other. Um, you know other areas, which would be, of course, the the, the privilege of the legislature. Um, but I I suspect that um, some of it might be uh, that we would do well by trying to inform as 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 many legislatures and for their staff as as they would want to listen about what has been um, some of the history, the context, and and, and the uh, and the topics at at hand. So. Um, Rather than trying to um, have um, uh, you know an audience, let's say, um, or, or or somebody to listen to us a few days before the expiration of the you know next next July or whatever that is, if we could try to um, to do some of those efforts earlier than that um, this time around, we might be um, uh, in a better position to do that. So we'll take a look at the proposed language um, and make sure that we uh, restart our review of, of where we are with that and bring it before the commission so you can take a closer look at some of the proposals. Um, we can figure out whether they're still fresh um, and, and chart a path forward um, with racing and simulcast. You know, and on that note, I, I'm, I'm sorry, just, um, on that note, um, I remember um, a, a chart, a comparative chart um, that we saw. It, it would be a matter of kind of like picking up on, on our records um, that, that gave um, a comparison of what other states have done or have done in certain areas. The amount of premium, for example, um, or takeouts that's reasonable and sometimes in our case prescribed by statute and whatnot that gave way to you know uh, um, our pos the position if you will on the 128d um, and I should note that a lot of what 128d did was to bring the uh, uh, the authority to to uh, to make certain decisions into the commission um, where it currently doesn't reside so that 
that kind of uh, prior um, documentation that we've done and work that we've done uh, would go a long way towards both informing the newer commissioners, refreshing the memory of those of us who have been here uh, longer, and then uh, hopefully also um, educating the legislature who would want to be um, educated on. That's great. We can, that? we okay, make let's sure move that. on then to the charitable, uh, on to the ethics issue, please. Thanks, okay. Todd. Sure. The, the third item uh, on the chart pertains to the application of the state conflict of interest law to members of the commission's subcommittees. Uh, this matter relates to a provision of Chapter 268A, Section 4, which governs the concept of divided loyalties, uh, where the subcommittees are considered state agencies and its members are special state employees for purposes of the conflict of interest law. This section applies to them. Uh, the law provides essentially that a state employee may not receive compensation from anyone other than the Commonwealth in relation to a matter in which the Commonwealth is a party or has a direct and substantial interest, and that person may not act as an agent or attorney for anyone other than the Commonwealth in connection with that type um, of matter. Uh, community mitigation is essentially considered a particular matter in which the Commonwealth has a direct and substantial interest under the conflict of interest law. So this has posed a challenge uh, for the commission subcommittees and having members seated uh, in those statutory positions. We did discuss this matter with colleagues at the State Ethics Commission who were able to uh, prepare a proposal for an amendment to the law that would essentially exempt the subcommittee members from section four so that they may fully participate in such matters that are before the subcommittees uh, pertaining to mitigation. The general theory is that as government employees, the concern that someone would be engaged in furthering private or personal interest by sitting on both sides of the table uh, relative to the same issue are largely muted uh, in this context as it applies to municipal employees. So as described uh, on the chart, the proposal was submitted to the legislature in both 2016 and 2018. The efforts were taken up uh, in the legislative process as agency filed bills. The latest version was uh, House Bill 14 that was reported favorably by the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies. Um, and that certainly sounds positive, but that was the last entry um, available on that particular bill. So that's where we stand uh, with this conflict of interest uh, related uh, legislation. If there are uh, comments um, or thoughts on, on that one. I, I actually have one um, question, maybe, you know, with your background, you might know, uh, Madam Chair, or or um, or if anybody sort of cares to venture, I guess. But I wonder if uh, if there has been other examples of exemptions to the ethics uh, law. I think that um, Todd would say that I think the Cannabis Commission actually the the statute incorporates this um, provision. Was it Todd? Did you mention that to me, or did I hear that from someone else? No, I, that was me. Um, I, I believe, I didn't, I apologize. I didn't uh, have a, a chance to go check the cannabis legislation, yeah. but I do believe there's a specific exemption in the cannabis control statute that allows their subcommittee members to participate uh, regardless of the divided loyalties provision, at least as it applies to municipal employees, not to every subcommittee member. Um, but no, because no. of the shared government interest, that's really the theory behind it, so. Now well, that I know that there's been some action, um, I'm happy to follow up um, perhaps with um, folks um, at the legislature on the status of this at this time. Um, this is, yeah. And we, there's still some life in, in this one in that it's quite finite. And if in fact it is incorporated into the Cannabis Commission statute, there may be some thinking that that, that could be um, something it could act on. So uh, Todd and, and Jill um, and Crystal and uh, Karen, we can do some follow-up on that one. I was unaware that 
of the um, sets. This is why it's so, this is so helpful today, uh, Todd, to get this legislative update. And Karen, if we could keep this as a recurring uh, matter, you know, Jill will be following um, with Crystal's help um, the status because legal can't keep track of all of that, but legal will working, be working hand in hand with Jill and her team yep. to keep Good track idea. of these legislative matters. But I think um, having a maybe a quarterly basis, if you know, maybe there is no update, but um, it, if it's not on exactly our filings on matters that uh, that might be of interest to us. Jill, we talked about that the other day. It may not be always a matter of public meeting, but even um, Jill um, being able to report out to us on the status. Absolutely. Madam Chair, I think, I think that's a great idea. I think the, the updates also allow us the opportunity to communicate to stakeholders. Yes. And obviously on the racing bill, there are lots of stakeholders that we interact with so they can see what we're doing. Okay. Um, right. On this and I last note. All of, I, I would want um, yeah. each commissioner, if you have an idea, the one thing I'd ask is if you could coordinate with me and Jill, because the one thing we want to do is to have a, a process uh, so that we aren't um, undoing each other's steps or, or being inconsistent in any way. So Jill will be the, the, the point person for our outreach so that we have a coordinated message. I think, Karen, if that's if you want yeah. to elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the plan going forward uh, so that, that we're all on the same page and we have a consistent message with our external stakeholders. Mr. Stevens, and, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 that's fine. Uh, and just to note on this last item, and, and as Councillor Grossman said, it's been somewhat of a challenge because we do have a number of municipal officials who have been selected to sit on our committees. You know, the, it was reported favorably by the Joint Committee on Economic Development, and they did that about a month before uh, we fell into this current crisis. So it yeah. certainly shows that it was making some traction before uh, the world changed. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm especially encouraged that you, as you say, um, Madam Chair, that uh, Cannabis Commission has, has this specific exemption. Um, and there's a lot of parallels to you know, the way in which we, we operate here. Um, I just realized that uh, today. I didn't, I didn't realize. Well, I think Todd wants to confirm, but I feel like I had that memory as well, but I might be wrong. So we'll confirm it. Confirm that. So those Any are the- of, Oh, there. Uh, oh, Todd, you just shifted on my screen. <laughs> oh. I'm so, so <laughs> sorry. Did, did it happen to you up. too, Joe? <laughs> yes. Oh. I'm, I've been sitting here the whole time. Um, <laughs> those are the existing initiatives, as we talked about. There are, of course, others. There's the tribal, the federal tribal legislation pertaining to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe that we will uh, make sure gets on um, a list. Uh, there's sports wagering and online gaming, um, things of that nature. Those, of course, are not our direct initiatives, or at least haven't been. That's something that's really, of course, up to the commission as to what we play in things like that but um so that's why they weren't discussed here today but things that we will monitor well i i say that uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should monitor even those those that pertain to gaming or licensees potentially um and i recall there's a statute um there's a section in the statute that directs us to, to monitor so getting those updates periodically would be very helpful um, right. I'm, I'm particularly thinking of uh, on, on, on the most recent uh, effort that I think over the summer was happened maybe over the course of a day or two uh, about uh, uh, sports betting, uh, which failed, which is fine. This is the way that, you know these things happen on occasion. Um, but we were asked to give some um, um, you know some 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 comments on on a draft language. And, and there was very little, uh, you know, certainly no time to come back and discuss at a commission meeting. Um, the, the staff did, did do a great job in providing um, comments. And again, the fake, you know, that, that, effort, um, that effort failed. Um, it also takes me back to um, the times where um, there was a lot of activity really around um, daily fantasy sports. There was a, you know, a lot of, um, consultation with a, a statutory um, 
commission and um, a lot of a lot of feedback that we provided um, to that to that effort um, and ultimately a white paper um, that uh, you know that was uh, again a, a good effort and and, and uh, etc. I see some parallels that and of to course that commissioners commissioners and I just want to I don't mean to interrupt but I just want to just let you know that of course um, it, we've been quite public with the legislature that our team has been um, staying apprised of all the developments on sports wagering and, and has made great efforts in being prepared for that in the event that we are asked to be the regulator. Um, and, and, and so, uh, while there haven't been necessarily public reports on that, that work has been ongoing and has been ongoing really uh, certainly since I have been here for the last two years and the legislature has heard from the commission um, on on that, um, both informally and even in testimony. So I just want to make sure that there's not an impression that we haven't been um, um, working on this as uh, as an enterprise. Simply that you know we have been in a position of of of, of listening and being prepared, and um, and unlike the other initiatives where there were um, you know, there was a, a, a really a, a requirement for us to do a filing. In this instance, we are um, we are listening to our legislative colleagues and 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 uh, being prepared for them and informing them um, as as requested. And that's where I think you saw that uh, Executive Director Wells did respond to a, a request for comment. And that's very very normal. Um, when there's legislation for agencies to be requested, you know, to be asked on all, any bill that's pending. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and uh, thank you for that clarification. I didn't mean to um, create the impression that, um, that we had not been on top of any of these. Um, right. I was speaking more from a personal perspective of, you know, would like, liking, would like to weigh in to the extent that, that, that I can as a commissioner in some of those, um, some of that um, comments that, that that we are as unfortunately some sometimes it happens on a very quick turnaround time like it did last summer and that's not entirely possible for at least for this commissioner um, the notion is or my only point here is and perhaps it's a very small one is to continue to talk about it um, in these you know periodic reports to the extent that we that we can to offer um, feedback where we feel is needed on whatever draft um, uh, language may be out there. Um, and, and I'm specifically thinking of something that's in, in you know, in later for us this afternoon, I guess. Um, the, the annual report had uh, that very topic on a recommendation to address the um, online gaming, whether it's on sports betting or, or, or fantasy sports. Um, and in a holistic way, it is now off of the, that annual report. Um, but I think um, that recommendation, which was done, from, which came from the white paper, uh, it's still relevant as if whether the the, uh, the legislature decides to move on on, on this or not. Um, and that's the only point I'm I'm, I'm making, um, because we have not talked about it amongst ourselves as a commission, it's not clear that we have that as a position. Okay. Um, so does that conclude your legislative update? Um, unless there's other questions from the, the other commissioners? Commissioner Cameron, are you all set? All set, no questions, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, welcome back. I don't know what you heard. Um, I came in at the end. Um, the only thing I would say is I think there are a couple sort of ministerial things to add into the chart. I think that we talked about the other day, Todd, about, and maybe you talked about this already, um, some of the things that um, dealt with the exemptions for certain employees, et cetera, that way the commission proposed and went through. And so sort of keeping this as a document that has those in it as well, just to keep that complete. Um, so what you're referencing are the the, the efforts of, um, that were accomplished, and he did lead with those. So you're just going okay. to update that. Okay. You're going to update that okay. filing. That's excellent. Might okay. as well keep it as a record of um, of the the pluses and the pendings and the ones right. that that go by the wayside. Sure. 
Right. And then I think um, jumping in when um, Commissioner Zuniga's comments just now, I think, you know, we can sort of talk about where we want to go when we look at the revised annual in terms of what, if anything, do we want in terms of a more in-depth uh, update by legal on other bills that are out there of interest to the commission that might not be something we've been statutorily obligated to put out as a draft, but nonetheless something that could impact us. And so maybe we want to keep apprised of what's out there. But I think we can table that for the annual topic number eight. Okay. Commissioner Stebbins, anything further? I'm all set. Okay. All right, Karen, did you have anything to add on this? Because it's relatively a, a, a new a new update, but I think one that will keep yes. going. No, I think just the uh, the feedback that this is beneficial and that this is something that should be recurring was very helpful. So the staff will maintain that going forward. All right. So thank you, and and, and it, it will take a whole team effort because there's so much um, crossover. But uh, thank you for uh, Jill and Christopher um, being our our lead contacts, and and then of course with the great um, assistance of the legal team. So thank you. All right, I've had to shift my my situation here. So um, the next is um, Derek. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Uh, on our um, our budget update, and I'm going to shift the, the lighting here. Uh, do we see? Good oh, there you are, Derek. Everybody is on a different line today, and um, for some reason, and I see Agnes at the top of my. Uh, <laughs> like my to chart. keep people moving around, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For some reason, I was not all you all froze, and then I realized it was me and not you. So. Um, I had to do a quick change, so thank you for your patience as I shifted. Um, okay, and we have Doug now, Derek. So. so good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you. Good I'm afternoon. joined by Doug and Agnes, um, as you pointed out, and today we're here to present to you the first quarterly fiscal year 2021 budget update um, of of large importance is this is Agnes's first public meeting since retiring that she's actually partaking in. She's She's been to quite a few of them, but back on camera. So if you have any <laughs> questions, now's the time to get them in. Uh, <laughs> um, but for the report, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission approved a fiscal year 21 budget for the Gaming Control Fund of 32.42 million, which required an initial assessment of 29.67 million on licensees. Uh, as reported in the FY20 closeout update, um, FY20 revenue exceeded FY20 expenses by 1.06 million, and the time of re reimbursements for um, the independent monitor of $1 million for uh, FY20 expenses did not happen until fiscal year 21, which res uh, results in the initial FY21 assessment for the gaming control fund being reduced by 2.06 million from 29.67 million to 27.61 million. Um, I'll refer people back to the June. Um, in the September memo, if we want to get into that, but I, you know, that was a rather in-depth process of explaining uh, modified cash basis of accounting for the Commonwealth and timing of revenues and receipts and our delays in making billings for the assessment uh, for the independent monitor. Um, when the commission approved the initial FY21 budget, there were a few known exposures. Uh, once again, we budgeted the bare minimum for um, lit our litigation budget. Um, MSP o overtime was funded at the same level as FY20, and if you recall in FY20, which we can't forget because we're still living it, um, the casinos were closed for three months. So that that funding for FY21 really only took into consideration nine months of activity, and we tried to carry that same level into FY21. Um, as we discussed earlier, the independent monitor revenue um, was not budgeted for this year. Um, it's a revenue neutral item. So as expenses come in, we're billing pretty much the same day we make the payment now. So we increase revenue at the same time expenses come in. And you see that on attachment A, we've increased by I think around 195,000 for the expenses that we've seen uh, paid out this year. And we've received almost all of that revenue um, to date. Doug can um, elaborate on that a little later. Um, 
And for the first time, the commission included a projection for turnover savings of 250,000 this year. I'm pleased to report that um, as of you know the first quarter, we've already realized over half of that. Um, and if you look at through November, we've re we've actually realized about 177,000 of that um, of that turnover savings. Uh, for the first time in any fiscal year, um, since we began tracking the game and control fund, licensing fees may actually not meet projections. So every year we've exceeded projections. Um, this year we may not actually meet them and the one area we're keeping a close eye on is employee licensing. Um, you know, that makes sense. We were seeing between 30 and 40% turnover at the casinos um, when we were estimating 20%, so fees were just coming in much higher. Um, since COVID related closures have happened, we haven't seen much turnover at all for the people that have the jobs. Um, and we haven't seen much new hiring. So, um, you know, that's something we're gonna keep an eye on. May have to make some expenditure reductions in the future to meet that or um, go back to the licensees for assessment, which none of us really wanna do. So we're gonna keep an eye on trying to reduce some expenses in another area. Um, not much more to report really, um, you know, due to the uncertainty of this fiscal year, the numerous potential areas of exposure we're tracking right now, as well as this report only covering the first three months of the fiscal year, we're not recommending any changes right now to the current assessment, other than reducing the assessment, which we, you already voted to do in September uh, for the carry forward of FY20 surplus revenue and increasing both the expenses and the revenues by the 195,000 that's happened to date um, for the central, for the independent monitor. If you have any questions, um, Doug and Agnes, Doug, Agnes and I are available right now. Um, like I said, you only get Agnes two days a week, so hit her now. And uh, <laughs> Doug can kind of walk through our improved um, timing for the billing of the independent monitor expenses so that we don't get into a scenario like we're in at the end of last year. Doug, you wanna give a quick walkthrough of that? <clears throat> Doug, you're muted. How's that? Better. Hello, okay. Um, Hi, Doug. Yeah, last, Hi, Doug. hello there. Um, Last year, we did have a few issues with the monitoring fee, getting it out on a timely manner. But um, it, it, at this point, working with uh, EBH there, you know, prior to us even sending it out, they are fully aware of it when it's coming in, and they have been paying that uh, on a very timely manner. It's, you know, within a couple of days when they get it, it's um, submitted and it's paid. Uh, and with that being said, um, billing for all the casinos are well within their threshold since the beginning of the year. They're all paying close to 100% of, of, of the, uh, the timing. So they get a bill and it's paid the following day. Um, they have worked with us this year. They have really been terrific in all of our assessments, public health trust fund, uh, slot fees, all of those have been paid you reduced it to pay on a monthly basis, on billing on a monthly basis uh, during the situation, the COVID situation, and they have all been been up to date. As soon as they get a bill, it's paid out. So it's uh, you know it's been working very well, and they've been uh, they've been right on top of it with us. So it's uh, it's certainly good. We're not chasing anybody to get money. They are paying what's due and on a timely manner, and we have an open lines of communication with them. So. It, it, it's really been good. We're happy with the casinos. That's a great testament to your relationship, Derek and team and Karen. Um, that's so important and we know, particularly during these times, so great. I mean, it's not just process, it's a lot to do with the relationship, so thank you. Commissioner's questions on for, for Doug on that point and then for Derek on the overall report and for Agnes while we have you. No, just uh, thank you, and uh, this is a great update. Uh, um, thank you for all the work you do. As 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 uh, chair says, um, it relies on the on the relationships and on the day to day uh, of keeping track of all the multiple moving pieces. Um, I do agree with the recommendation of not 
uh, needing to move or, or change much. Um, the next few months uh, may bring uh, a couple of different, um, um, you know, dynamics, and that's that's fine. We'll react, and we'll have plenty of time within the fiscal year to uh, to make adjustments if we need to. Um, this what, what what is now going to be effectively a different um, um, hours of operations for the casino, so that may have some impact in some of the costs, like overtime for the state police, um, but also in, in in you know some of the collection of revenues and and whatnot. So, thank you. Um, um, Thank you for the update. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, for your, your work and your treasure capacity um, all very closely with this team. Commissioner Cameron, do you have any questions? Or I know that no. you've done work with the, um, on the, uh, the overtime. Um, yes. You, do you want to comment yes. on that? Well, I would have to um, speak to Captain Connors to know uh, where we are right now, but he's keenly aware of uh, those hours and you know made a uh, you know excellent effort to really monitor and make sure any hours uh, provided are are warranted um, and I want to thank uh, Derek and his team because under very trying times thank you for the good work and uh, yeah I, I agree that we're we're doing the best we can with this so thank you Derek, did you want to elaborate? I think there's been some successful meetings with the licensees and Captain Connors, um, Karen. Yes. Yeah. There have been some good meetings. Um, and, you know, we've seen a little bit, you know, each month we've seen a little bit over the target of 150,000 to hit the 1.8 million until, um, until October, where we actually came in at 149, um, <laughs> which is excellent. I mean, hey, it's a hard number to hit, right? I mean, 150 is what we were averaging for a nine month period, I mean, more than, you know, that's a 12 month period. We hit 1.8 over nine months last year. So Brian and his team are working very hard um, at, at getting these numbers. I think the collaboration with the casinos and with Commissioner Cameron has been excellent. Um, Karen's been really pushing that fact home too. But, you know, I just received a report from Brian too that they've actually utilized over 110,000 in straight time savings because they've had a hard time backfilling positions and those straight time savings more than offset the overage and over oh, so you know it's it's really you look at it as one budget the straight time and the overtime and um, overall they're under for that for that time period commissioner o'brien commissioner stebbins questions for derek and team i'm all set yeah i'm all set great do you need action from us today, Derek? No action. That's what I thought. Okay, <laughs> wanted to make sure I didn't miss something. Excellent. Great report, um, thorough, and a big thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I think then we are now moving on to commissioner updates. And of course, that's the annual report. Karen, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Zuniga, you wanna take the lead? Sure, um, thank you. Um, in the packet, uh, colleagues, uh, there is a revised version of the annual report presented last meeting in, in revision mode of the changes that um, uh, Commissioner O'Brien and I worked on as a result of the conversation from that last meeting. Um, I can uh, take them one at a time or, or pause there and, and see if anybody has any idea, any um, preference uh, rather as to how to and whether to discuss some of these, um, some of these changes. Well, um, I did wonder about the process here because of course um, we got the, um, the, re the update on you know, Tuesday or whatever because we couldn't have access to the SharePoint. And this is where um, uh, editing by committee becomes, as I think Sarah Magazine said, you know, it's, it's complicated. Uh, so um, I did have some additional thoughts, mainly, of course, to my own letter um, that's included in here. 
and one of the things I think that was noted, and I and I would like to include it, Commissioner Zuniga, would be the convening of the equity and inclusion subcommittee, and hopefully not um, impacting the length of the the um, the letter, because I know you probably have a you know a configuration in mind, unless we make it very tiny, tiny, tiny font. Um, so I don't know how to be efficient about changes that I had. I had a few other, um, you know, kind of knit stuff, but so if there were any motion that we were making, I assume we might be working by consensus would be, of course, you know, little typos and everything will be addressed. Um, anything like that. Um, I don't, I don't really have a great suggestion as to how to proceed. Commissioner O'Brien made some great edits. I know it was to strengthen a couple of items, particularly around the relicensure, that I think it was Commissioner Stebbins who felt we should do that, as well as just um, really the great work that not only we did as a commission, and of course the team did, but also our licensees did during those roundtable discussions on producing guidelines that were adopted by the governor as the industry standard. So, you know, those were the two items I think uh, Commissioner O'Brien uh, she did other work, of course, too, on it, but that, that was from our last discussion. So um, how would you like to proceed, Commissioner Zuniga? Do you want to hear those? Or I'm not even sure what the rules are with respect to open meeting law in terms of how um, do I have to read these edits into the record? Um, however, however you want, um, I, I think um, I'm sure that uh, whatever you thought of for um, the letter from the chair, I will, I will agree. Um, what, you know, especially in the notion of um, what I think is relevant to put in uh, relative to that equity and equity and inclusion working group. Um, just on, on, so I, I'm fine if you want to, you know, speak about them in summary or in detail. But um, just understand that I, I, I I'm sure it'll be fine from my perspective. Um, the other part of, of that uh, is that, you know, we can clearly work with the format. Um, it doesn't, you know, we should not limit ourselves to, to one page. It was just, you know, something in terms, you know, that I mentioned last time. Um, so if it's but one page relevant, sounds right to me too, so, yeah. <laughs> for yeah. a letter, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and we can easily just, you know, lead, edit, edit down, whatever else needs to be, and that would be also fine. Maybe I should have mentioned earlier, that I think the bulk of the last discussion, the last meeting and discussion was really relative to those recommendations for legislative action. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, you did mention uh, some of the uh, language from Commissioner O'Brien um, in, in, in the earlier parts, but, but that's where she provided also the bulk of, um, of the comments, we are, which are in page, uh, page seven. It's really not page seven of the packet, it's page seven of the of the report. Yeah. Um, and we have, um, if I can, you know, if I can summarize uh, what, what, what the intention was uh, of hers um, to just reference prior efforts and uh, like, like we did in the first paragraph and then uh, speak to in detail um, what we did this last year, last fiscal year. Uh, and that's memorialized in, the, in this, um, these new edits uh, relative to horse racing. Uh, that that has been the bulk of the rewrite. Um, you'll notice that two other recommendations uh, have been at least for now deleted. Um, but uh, one one thing that I think it's important for us to whether it's part of this report or more importantly a future discussion, as I was saying earlier, um, one of these topics might be the notion of anything that that happens to the gaming industry that happens to be online. Um, and that is um, something that, again, at, as of this moment, we're silent on in the annual report, but it's something that, in my opinion, merits future discussion. If I could add to that, I, um, Madam Chair, first of all, that's your letter. And I think we do not have to hold this up to edit that. You talked about what you'd like to add, and that's entirely appropriate. So I, I don't think there's any need to, to hold this because of that. Um, I think the edits that were made are make the document stronger. And uh, to speak about the last point, which is online, and uh, I just think because we haven't spoken about these issues with this current commission, 
that it's that it's appropriate not to have it in this report. But I agree with you, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, that uh, having that talking about those things it, as a commission is appropriate in, in the near future. Yeah, and if I could follow up um, the conversation that Enrique and I had, and I had when we were doing the edits, um, dovetails with. Um, Todd's presentation earlier, which is what are the topics that we should probably be updated on on a more regular basis as a commission and this area of online gaming sports betting is definitely one of them. Because it has been imminent several times and then not happened. Uh, we don't know if we're going to be asked to regulate or not. We may. Um, and so to, to be in a position where we're as informed as we can be akin to the white paper that was done under different circumstances, that that is something that we should probably add in to the agenda setting list in terms of something that should be a topic that we circle back to either two by twos or you know even some sort of update in terms of the various legislations that have been put before the general court and the commonwealth on this topic so that we as a commission can get a gauge um, on what's out there and maybe other areas that we've thought about um, i think not having it in this report because it does not speak to what was done in this fiscal year is appropriate but i do think that we need to put it on the radar screen i know we're getting another counsel into the general counsel's group you know we used to have an attorney who specialized in just this area someone probably will take on that responsibility once we're getting up to more fully staffed and so this is a really good time i think to think about how we want to make sure we're all well informed on this issue Yeah, well said. Uh, part of this was um, is, is also um, a reflection of, um, of the departure of at least uh, Justin, for example, who used to do a great job at, at, at keeping appraised of, the, uh, us appraised of this. Um, and we've been a little uh, lean on the legal department um, uh, for other reasons, but um, um, just keeping it on the radar. Uh, yeah, and, and again, I want to make sure to not um, in any way understate the efforts that have gone on by the rest right. of the team during this Absolutely. time. Absolutely. No, um, and Justin, just so everybody knows, Justin did do an update of the white paper, and I think that was distributed mm -hmm. widely before he left. I hope that everybody has that on the current state, and that's probably pretty up to, up to date. But um, I think that we've um, established that. Um, for legislation outside of even sports wagering or online gaming, something that could impact us, including maybe the budget updates, just so we're aware as good uh, stewards of government to understand that. Um, you know, I know, for instance, even some might be interested in the police reform bill that's pending. So Jill um, so, um, will be um, um, monitoring this with Crystal and, and, and keeping track of of uh, legislative developments that might be of interest, even if not necessarily exactly on point. So we have been we have been asking for this, and Karen came up with a really good solution um, on exactly these legislative updates. Todd knew that I wanted it um, on the agenda, and thank you uh, for today's report. He had to go back and get um, updated. So this work has been. Um, uh, underway for the last several months, as well as um, we were really lucky to have recently a, a great meeting with um, the state of Indiana on, on their uh, work in sports wagering. Uh, of course, the commission you are aware that, you know, went down to New Jersey right before COVID-19 to get informed, a, a good team, um, our IT team went back to New Jersey. So there's been a lot of work and I just want to make sure that there's no messaging that this um, commission is not staying vitally um, up to date on these important issues. But I am hearing you say you want reporting and I think now we have the mechanism in place um, to do that. Uh, and it will be, um, you know, how it gets reported. I think Commissioner O'Brien, you mentioned it could be in a variety of fashions and I think um, you know, whether we do it on a monthly basis internally and then maybe a quarterly basis um, through a public meeting, you know, we can think about that, but I'm going to leave that to Karen and, um, and team to figure out how best to make sure all the commissioners are, are well informed on these efforts and, and any related. And so the other 
thing I would ask affirmatively is if you see something that you want to get more information, something that we're not mentioning, but you know, we certainly get a lot of um, news in terms of both federal and state uh, initiatives, and I suppose even some local commissioner Stebbins, you might be thinking about that as well. You know, we have a team who can help us um, um, be informed. And I also said to Jill, she's gonna see it and Crystal, they're gonna see it. They're gonna need the legal team to help understand it and to be able to translate it to us. So um, I think my, um, my response today is I feel really good about the fact that we have a team in place now to make sure that this is, this um, is happening. Uh, these are efforts are, are um, that we receive proper information, that we're informed on a continuing basis. And if you don't feel informed, you know, now you know that we have a, internal resources to, to reach out to. Does that make sense, Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner O'Brien? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I do. I do think that this area in particular, because there are different, you know, I mean, not they're all virtual now, given the world that we're in, but because it's so fast moving and changing, um, it's something that probably should be at the front of the list. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe yeah. A, a top on its own, aside from sort of the general legislative update. That would be my, my two cents. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that, you know, um, the legislature is really busy right now thinking about this. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that our being good listeners right now is also really important too, so. All right, um, excellent. Karen, that was, that's great. I feel good about the fact that um, we've got the team in place. I see Jill with a, a smile. I know Jill and, and Chris are excited about this um, opportunity, so we um, appreciate their, t their teamwork. So in, in terms of the annual report, if I may, um, can I just assume that um, we, we take your uh, suggested edits, Madam Chair, Madam Chair and, um, and get on with uh, trying to um, move this report further? So those were, um, I haven't made any edits. Those are Commissioner O'Brien and your great work. I want to make well, sure that yeah, that's I should actually, actually, yeah. yeah, I should actually uh, distinguish both. Uh, can we assume that there is no objections to the current edits in revision mode? And then as Commissioner Cameron mentioned, let you make whatever edits you see fit in the letter from the chair um, and then uh, proceed with the final draft of this document. Commissioner Stebbins, do you have additional um, edits? Because you too haven't had the opportunity to chime in. Uh, it's, if we could all use SharePoint, Commissioner Zuniga. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then no, make that I, a public right, you know, but we can't because we'd be responding to each other outside of the, the public arena. So No, I, I I think the strong version in the in, in the edits that Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner O'Brien have made look great. Um, you know, my one point was to to elevate the profile of the relicensing of PPC, uh, because that is that's a first for this agency as well in its life. So, uh, and I'm happy to see how that was how that was managed in the new version. So, I'm I'm comfortable with it. And certainly, uh, Madam Chair, it's, it's your letter. Um, whatever changes you want to make to it, um, I'm sure are appropriate. And you know, let's let's move this ahead to a final version and, and produce it. But thanks to my colleagues for all their great work and the teams for all their great work to put all the pieces together. So I think I've heard, we've heard from everyone on the report. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, it's always, um, always great to have somebody come in after you've done your first strong draft and Commissioner Zuniga accomplished that and then to have some extra sets of, of eyes and, and thoughts and your edits first, superb, so thank you. Um, and so, do we have a consensus? Do we need a vote on this, Commissioner Zuniga? You'd like that, correct? We, we haven't done it in the past, and I, and I seem to be hearing a consensus, so um, I don't think that might be necessary. Yeah, and, and I think in terms of, I, um, on the legislative update, I think um, keeping a record of the history as part of our um, internal documents is a, it's really important, and then having the, the fiscal report, fiscal year report, 
indicate exactly what we've done is probably the best practice. So I'm in agreement with that for, for this. So I do, I think I'm hearing a consensus. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And now the next steps, um, Sarah um, and you will coordinate and perhaps we, we leave maybe Sarah, I think Elaine had done this in the past, uh, just if there's those little edits that, um, for cleanup, Commissioner Zinnika, is that how Absolute, you know? Absolutely, they, they, they give it a, you know, and by the way, I should mention, Sarah uh, has already provided a lot of uh, really good feedback on, on the version you're seeing here. Um, but yeah, they do, um, you know, and we, we can, uh, this will be a first time for her, but, but I'm sure, you know, she'd step up like she has in, in many other aspects uh, of dealing with our, mm -hmm. uh, and coordinating with our vendor, uh, Jack Rabbit, who, has, a really, has done a really good job in the past about putting graphics as well as uh, nice glossy pictures, um, you know, that are the theme of, of, um, of, of casino or gambling or horse racing, um, you know, and, and that will be uh, off to uh, final production. Excellent. Okay, consensus achieved. Great work, thank you. And, um, other commissioner updates. Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to give us a puppy update? Other than to say the reason I had to leave in the afternoon is I was given a reprieve from puppy duty for this morning, so. <laughs> the work in progress. Um, and the dog is already twice the size. Or uh, she's about 60% she's bigger than when we got her about three weeks ago, yeah. She's gonna be big. Wow. Yeah. Bell. So um, we'll see the yeah. dog appearing in the camera shot too at some point. Yeah, you'll see yeah. a cat. <laughs> she she wants to play with the orange cat, the black cat she has no interest in, so they've kind of reached simpatico, but um there's there's a war to be had that is yet to come. I'm sure I will tell you all about it. Because Mango's not so keen on He's not backing down. Nope. No, no. <laughs> All right. Other, um, I was I was observing my cat the other day, and I came to the conclusion. It hit me that he's thriving during this pandemic. It's been it's been right. great for him. Yeah. 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 Um, it will be an adjustment. Uh, they could only truly understand English as much as we do speak in full sentences to our animals. Um, they could understand that we um, we might have a. a an exit strategy, hopefully uh, next year. Mm. All right, uh, Karen, anything else that we need to address? No, ma'am. Okay, then um, first off to the entire team, it's been a, a long but full um, productive meeting. Thank you for staying on. We have 47 team members who have stayed on and, and other interested parties. So thank you as always. Um, I think we're going to be convening at the end of the uh, tomorrow um, with an, 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 a wonderful um, guest speaker uh, um, at the town hall, which we can report on at our at December 17th meeting. So for those of you who are seeing today, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, commissioners, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Just move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Thank you, everyone. And Commissioner Stemmons. Aye. Great work, everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you. Five zero. I vote yes. <laughs> <laughs>